Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I am designer Dave. Today, we are here with Christine Brownell. With over 20 years of experience in the game industry, Christine Brownell has a multitude of titles under her belt as a game designer, including Auto Assault, Star Trek Online, The Sim Social, and Temple Run Puzzle Adventure. Christine and I met each other at Blizzard Entertainment, where she was briefly entertained by my responses to quality assurance bug reports before moving to World of Warcraft as a quest designer and creating the Zelda tribute quest everyone knows and loves. Quickly moving from design to creative director at EA, she is now a game director at PlayStation London Studio. Please, everyone, welcome Christine Brownell. There's a crowd chair. Hey. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you glad you decided to do it because uh, a lot of people get a get uh, freaked out about the idea of, of uh, talking live. I know it's new to some people. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think I. Um... I think I had to get over some of that because when WoW Classic came out, um, Sean Carnes came to me and he said, let's, let's stream. And I was like, I don't know. All right. If, <laughs> I, you, if I can do it with you, let's do it. And did um, you yeah, stream WoW Classic? Yeah, we, we did stream WoW Classic right when it came out. Um, and we, we streamed, um, three times a week and we would, Whoa. you know, talk about development and people would come and ask questions really similar to the ones we're going to talk about today. And yeah, it was fun. It was very, um, it was sort of nice, you know, to like, especially to see WoW back in that state and then to have people that were super interested and also yeah. loved it the way we did. Was that, that's, that's the beauty of it. Like the, I did an interview with the Turtle WoW dev team. They have, they run a classic server that's like expanding on the old quest lines as opposed to, um, you know, it's, I guess it's illegal, whatever, they don't care. Um, but it, uh, it's a thing of beauty to see that community because they're very hyped about like classic wow and like wishing that things had continued on in that direction as opposed to the direction that it went which you know i don't want to talk too negatively about it but you know you can only have so many bigger threats before it <laughs> becomes unrealistic and kind of wears on you um uh so but i i like to start with the the question of you know how did you get into games like uh did it start in your youth or did it come upon you later as you were entering the adult world or you know, were you like, oh, God, I got to find a job and I'd rather work in games or <laughs> how did it go for you? Um, games sort of became my obsession when I was probably around nine or ten. Hmm. Um, I went to a I can remember the moment it happened, which is what I'm going to tell you. Um, I went to a birthday party of um, uh, a, a friend. So it was all it was all girls. And then. We were watching a movie. I wasn't that interested. I kind of wandered away and I found her younger brother in like this den kind of room. And yeah. um, he was playing Super Mario Brothers. And I had never, yes. I'd seen commercials, right? You've seen commercials for the Nintendo, right? But I didn't know anyone that had one and we didn't have one. And um, so I sat down and watched him for a while. And then he mm. was like, well, here, do you want to turn? Um, and I ended up just staying in there with him for the rest of the, the <laughs> evening. Like we stayed up and just really late and we're, we were both just playing Super Mario Brothers. And I, um, you know, like all the way at the end of, of one, one, there's that like, okay, can you jump over this gap? And then right after that is like a real hole and you have to jump yeah. over. We must've played that level like hundreds of times trying to get over that, that <laughs> hole. We were, we were terrible clearly. But, um, Everyone was I terrible. Have, I have, them. yeah, I have this memory and I was just like, and it's so funny you think about it now like it's literally like we were just bashing our head against this wall of trying to do this and i just remembered it as just having the best time yeah um and so it was then my goal like you know i just i love games after that and eventually managed to convince my parents to get us a nintendo and um you know it just it was just a thing for me after that it was always um, one of my favorite things and um actually sort of a, a, like a bonding thing for me and my younger brother right we we ended up just playing yeah. lots of games together. And I have a lot of memories of playing with him as a kid. That's cool. Yeah. My, my mom actually got into super Mario brothers because after I moved on to the Sega Genesis and she basically got the Nintendo <laughs> and I only had four games for it, but yeah, super Mario brothers was definitely uh, her favorite. And uh, I was surprised. Like, I didn't know you like games. And she's like, I didn't know either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Super Mario brothers and uh, legend of Zelda which I'm sure is not yeah. a surprise. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Legend of Zelda and um, uh, Rygar, which I don't think anyone... I remember Rygar. You I do remember. Hard. I do. Oh, it was yeah. super hard. No, and I was hardcore. I was like frame glitching because there was a way to like cheat if you got if you went to the left and right on a screen turnover at just the right moment, you could go up into the cliffs. But 
No, no one wants to hear about that. All right. <laughs> um, so <laughs> quality assurance at Blizzard was your first job in the game industry. Um, was it also your first job? And how did you find that opportunity? Uh, it was not my first job. I think as many Gen Xers, uh, we all started working when we were like 15 and a half. You're like, I can get that work permit and I can get a job and start making money. Um, I, I feel like there are a lot of us that did that. Um, so it was not my first job. And it wasn't even, um, it, it was, I, when I did this, I had graduated from Cal State Long Beach. I had gotten a quote unquote real job. Right? I was working for a screen printer in San, San Clemente, um, which was sort of uh, aligned with I had gotten a, a degree in art like graphic design and so I was you know basically doing layouts of, of stickers and other like point of purchase stuff and huh. it was as close to a real job as I had ever had um, even though it was really <laughs> casual and it was pretty fun and I really liked everyone there um, I had a couple of friends um, John B being one of them that were in the industry mm. right when he you know when he worked at point of view um, I knew a couple of the guys at point of view and I was, I was always talking to them, right? They, they would invite me to like their company parties and stuff. And so I'd get, I'd get like this little, like, you know, for like a night, I get to kind of like peek in and see what it was like. Um, or they let me come by the office a couple of times just to see what they were working on. They were super nice. And, um, company secrets, I realized, you know, what's that <laughs> company secrets. It was a lot more loose back then. I recall it, it really was. It, it really was. Just, yeah. Just a completely different world. But, um, I used to talk to them about like really wanting to get into the industry and I didn't know how, and they, and they just kept telling me like, you have to get in at the bottom, like any way that you can get in, like go work in QA or go work in tech support or, you know, get a job like that. And I was like, oh God, how, how can I make that work? And after two years of working at the screen printer, I realized that like, if I didn't do something about that, that it was never going to happen. Right. Yep. Because the going on the path I was going down, um, like where I was when I decided to do that was um, the screen printer I worked at uh, worked with a lot of like surf and skate companies. And I had at one point um, had someone basically give me an in at Quicksilver. I was like, hey, do you want to, you know, like, hey, would you want to come in here and maybe interview? And um, that's a skateboard company, right? Quicksilver is surf, more surf. I mean, maybe surf, skate, surf, okay. Mostly surfing. Um, and that I just met through, you know, like just the network that you build when you work somewhere like that. And I sort of made this decision to not call that person. Like I was basically like given like, Hey, you know, like here's, here's the number I'm going to call them, you know, here's what you do. And I didn't pursue that. And instead I went to the blizzard uh, website and they were hiring for QA and I yep. applied to QA. Um, and uh, I managed to get a role in QA where I was making like $8 an hour or something. Mm -hmm. which was definitely a step back from what I was earning. Yeah. And I quit my job and I went and worked in QA and my parents thought I was insane. She's crazy. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> They're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, it's a long-term plan. You just have to trust me. Long-term plan. Yeah. Um, but no, they, they did not. I don't think they really were sold on the whole idea until, um, um, I don't know. We'll get there. We'll get there. Remind me to come back to that question. Cause like I, it was not, it was not for quite, it was years before I think they understood what I was doing. So. Yeah. I, I had a similar experience. My parents didn't get it at all. I think my dad got it more than my mother, but my mother only knew video games as like something that I played and wasted all my time on. <laughs> so she was a, a little less receptive, but she accepted whatever I did. So, you know, good old mom. Um, <laughs> Uh, so a lot of people mythologize the early days of, uh, WoW's development. Uh, what was the process like for you guys in the quest team? Uh, and what sort of rhythm did you guys get into during development? Uh, so it was super fun. It was just, just, I just had such a great time on that team. Um, that team was so excited and so supportive and just, so just, we just all loved the thing we were working on. Um, hmm. and I found that everyone was. Um, obviously like coming into a team, especially when, you know, I was sort of the only woman coming into the team, right? It was a bunch of guys. Yeah. They were all just welcoming and friendly and, you know, sort of the opposite of the things that you might hear about women in the industry. I just, it, it was great. Um, I had a great time. And as far as the quest team, quest team was pretty tight and, um, it was, 
a loose process, I would say. Um, there was, <laughs> so I always tell people on WoW, there was like no documentation of anything, right? Like I have more uh, yeah. teams that like are kind of on the other side of that, like document <clears throat> everything and it's all like tracked and um, everyone has to sign off on documents and um, no documentation on the WoW team. Um, it was pretty much just, um, you know, full speed ahead, right? Um, the quest team, the way that we would quest out a zone, I'm sure it looks really different now, right? I always think about like how much it obviously has changed given that they do, you know, voice work and, you know, like how far ahead you have to be working in order to put oh, something yeah. like that in and sign off yeah, on yeah. something. So you're like, yes, the, that matches the text that we're putting in. Um, not a thing, right? So uh, we would get the group together and it would be like, hey, we're going to quest out these three zones. Um, and so we would, we would, it would usually be after lunch. We would pull Chris Metzen into the room. Chris Metzen would come and like, you know, talk about the zone. Cause it's like, this, all this stuff is in his head. Right. And he's just yeah. like, Hey, let me tell you about winter. Spring. And he would just talk at us for like, you know, like 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And he would just tell us everything that was going on there. Um, as far as, you know, story wise or, um, you know, like what was spawned where. Like a lot of times the like a level designer would come over like whoever was um building that area so like Bo that you interviewed before like Bo would come over and like draw on the on the whiteboard here's what the zone looks like here's the different points of interest here's where things are spawned um and then it would go away and then we would um we would have a list of like all of the targets because that's the way that we um back in the day that is that is how we decided um we kind of split up the zone so that everyone had a different piece of it. We would do it by right. the, the spawn, like what was spawned. So we'd have a list of the things that were spawned. It's like, okay, you will take this area where these fur bulks are, right? Like that's yours. Um, and so we would, we would do round robin on that. There's a big list of stuff. And so we would just go round robin and pick things. Um, and then we would say, go team. And then we'd go back into our offices and um, we would write up, um, you kind of look at, you know, look at what you had to work with. I'd, I'd usually go and like run around in the, in, you know, just in, um, the build yeah. that was on my server and, um, get some ideas. We would write them up, um, as far as like, okay, here's the quest that I want to do in these areas that would go to Chris Metzen, including all the names. You had to name all the NPCs. He had to approve every single NPC name. Uh, my, maybe so... my fault. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think he just wanted to, I mean, honestly, I think he only ever said no to one thing ever that I suggested. So like yeah. he was really like, Hey, yes, come and build in this world with me. He was super collaborative. So he just really wanted to take a look at everything, say, Hey, that all sounds great. Um, and then it was get it done. Right. And that was the level um, of autonomy that we had. Um, and it was amazing. Yeah. That um, is an amazing. If you, if, yeah. I mean, given the other places that I've worked, you know, sometimes that's not the case. And um, but it was just, it was really great. And, um, we were all just sort of trusted to get the work done and yeah. that, you know, like occasionally we'd have, you know, a producer coming in and saying, Hey, is that done yet? When will that be done? And that was the level of tracking that we had. Right? There's not like no, no, no Jira. No, yeah. No <laughs> Jira. Well, we had inspector, right? We had inspector. Oh, did like, you? That oh, was that's right. Yeah. In it. Inspector <laughs> was for bugs, right? So you knew if you got bugs, yeah. right? Like the bugs would come back up, but task that tracking, was it. not a thing. Oh, I, um, I we got barely remember Inspector. Now I'm remembering, remembering Inspector. I still miss Inspector. I still it was pretty good. Inspector. Yeah, it was. it was so easy. I wonder if they still use it. Yeah. Uh, so the the reason I think I might have been the problem for Metzen in terms of naming is that in Warcraft 3, <laughs> uh, I, I, for whatever reason, ended up naming tons of stuff. And one of the things that I did was I slipped in a few friends' names into the Paladins. So there's a paladin named Bujan, and for whatever reason, it he got it randomly, and like he came and was asking about it. And he's like, "Who named this guy Bujan? Couldn't you think of something a little more Warcraft?" I'm like, "It was a friend. I put it in there as a favor. I didn't think it would be a big deal." <laughs> I put plenty of um, friends' names in, into WoW, but I would usually like adjust them so that they sort of fit into the world. Um, you were smarter yeah. about it than I was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't just use it, except my brother, Andrew, is in there just as Andrew Brownell. He uh, is in Undercity. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Brownell is a pretty, th that fits, I think, into the universe, but maybe it's just me. Yeah, he's an um, undead guy with a mohawk. I, I was like, <laughs> that's you. That's you. Come on. Looks just like you. Fair enough. Uh, so what was your favorite quest to create? And uh, what, in your opinion, was the best quest that you didn't create? So your favorite one to make and favorite one that you didn't 
Hmm. There's a few that I have that I think I really just enjoyed. Like I loved making the Zelda quest. Like that was just this, you know, <laughs> epic quest line. It was right after we got told, Hey, players are higher level. Now you need to have them going to all kinds of different zones. Uh, you know, like one quest line could take you through all these zones. And we were like, okay, so that's the reason that that line does that. It kind of takes you everywhere. Um, but just coming up with like, of course, like being a, such a, such a, a fan, right. It was figuring out like, what are all the things that I can sort of hint at in here and put references to that other people that love Zelda will enjoy seeing. Um, so I loved putting that together. I'd say the other thing that I really enjoyed doing was I have a couple of quests that do this. Um, they're escort quests, but the person or creature you're escorting will not always follow you. Um, so Ringo, Ringo that you find in the, the volcano in Unguro Crater. Um, oh, he has, he has that, fainted yeah. and you have to like pour water on him. Yeah. Um, and as you're bringing him back, you have to keep an eye on him because he'll keep fainting because he's got to be the poor guy. Um, yeah. And so he'll faint. He, he always like will broadcast to you that this is happening. But yeah, you can't you can't just like mindlessly run back because you might leave him behind. Um, so I really liked putting those in um, and I'm looking forward again to I'm looking forward to answering that um, escort quest um, question later that someone has sent in because <laughs> we'll get there. that was a response to not really enjoying how mindless escort quests were. Um, mm. and I really wanted to make them more interactive. And so that was, I don't know, you know, how many people I probably annoyed by doing that at the same time, but, um, to me, it was just, it made it more interesting. And so I really liked, um, how that one came out also, um, yeah. other side of that. Oh, yeah. sorry. Well, I, I was just remembering Ringo myself and, uh, <laughs> it's, it's all vague because I haven't played well classic in so long, but I definitely remember going to some Island and then. Uh, but that's part of the Lincoln quest. Never mind. <laughs> Is there an eye? There's probably an eye. Anyway, yes. Ring <laughs> yeah, Ringo's in the volcano in the middle of a grow crater. Um, <laughs> quest that I didn't create that I wish I, I could have is um, I had been assigned. I basically begged for it. Um, the um, Anixia scale cloak quest. Oh. I had begged to get that one and I was given that one and I was so excited. and. It, I was working on it and had just started work on it. And that's right when the layoffs hit. And so it, my version of it was never to be, um, essentially, but that's I was planning on something that was very, I don't know how similar it would have been to the Zelda quest, but it probably would have had multiple steps like that. And I had been talking to Metzen about a lot of the lore to try to work that in. And I was just really excited about it. So that was the thing that I, I sort of always like, oh, I wish I could have done that, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, that would have been awesome. Um, you know, I I don't remember what I was working on when I left, but there were definitely a few quests that got left empty <laughs> because I had to suddenly vacate the office. Um, oh, that that answers the next question. <laughs> uh, is that the one that you uh, is that the quest you would have you were planning to create that you really wish you could have gotten into the game? Yeah, yeah. Any yeah, others along those lines? That one. What's that? Any other quests that you were really hoping to get in there or was it so um, abrupt? I mean, there were, there were quests <laughs> that like, I didn't get a chance to finish in Feraloss. So Feraloss, um, you know, it's oh, like yeah. that foresty zone. Um, and one of them, I just, I, I left a piece of it in there because it was just really fun to play with. And so that NPC that teleports you to the top of the Twin Colossals, and then you can buy a parachute and jump off. Yeah. It's actually a part of a quest. Um, and I didn't have time oh. to put it in. But I left that in there because people like jumping off stuff and it was just yeah, a it was fun, fun. Thing to put in there. Yeah, so I left it in because I was like, well, people will love doing this, even if there's kind of no point to doing it. It's just fun to be able to go up there and be like, wow, look how high I am up here. And I can jump off and be safe doing that because I've been given an item that means I won't die if I jump off this. That, that's um, the thing that's missing from like a lot of the MMORPGs that followed WoW is they forgot the sense of wonder that they're supposed to instill in people. And uh, I, I don't know if it was done... I mean, in that case, that was like a happenstance, but there was a lot of that in WoW <laughs> where you just would find things and like, you know, crazy quests in the middle of nowhere and things like that. Yeah, um, and I, I do love, like, I think what's great about WoW Classic is that you can see sort of the human aspect of the people that made it yeah. um, and it. And that piece, it was so much more, hey, this is the format we're using for everything, I think, after that. And yep. so you, they got it, it, 
to me, it was the imperfections in, in, in WoW and that, you know, original launch that made it so special to people, you know, because it's not perfect. In a lot of places, it really isn't. And there's a lot of weird, quirky things in it. And um, it's, the, the, it's one of the, the quirks make it cool, though. Like that's I keep telling this to um, like new development studios start up and they all want to like follow the formula of what's successful. And I keep telling them, no, no, no. Embrace the weird. Go for the quirky think of like crazy things in your own head and slide in your own personal take on things because that's what makes people like love a game as opposed to just enjoy like, uh, yeah. yeah. I totally um, agree. Yeah. I mean, just the reason that I had put that thing into fair last week and jump off is I had just yeah. been playing, you know, I, it was when the alpha was open and I would just watch what players did and they like to jump off stuff right there was just something that i kind of like had noted people like to jump off stuff even if they might die they'll still jump off of it sometimes because it's just kind of a fun thing to do and so i was like i always looked for things like that where it's like can we tap into that and use that as something that might be fun in a quest yeah um but yeah i think i always have kind of gone after those things where it's like this is joyful and fun and it might make someone laugh um that's always what i've been drawn to i think as a designer yeah I think because a lot of these companies don't have that sort of autonomy, we, we miss out on a really, really cool things like that. Yeah. Um, and I think also the, um, sort of, uh, you know, recently data has become, uh, you know, a, a much bigger piece of how games get designed. And when you started. don't have data on something, <laughs> it's such a huge risk, right? So if you try to explain like what the value of putting in, Hey, I just put this in and players can jump off this thing, right? If, if, yeah. As a designer, me trying to explain the value of that, it's one of those things that's really hard to quantify, right? You can't say, oh, well, that's going to give us, a, you know, X amount of revenue or, you know, it's going to impact retention in this way. It's really yeah. hard. And, and then they'll always have that sort of cynical shutdown moment where they're like, well, we'll see how many people actually use it. And you'll find that it is rare, but the people who do use it remember it for the rest of their life <laughs> and you can't you can't buy that with data analytics um so uh, yeah you need you need a little bit of that right you need to have those special moments where people feel like they've um come across you know something unexpected yeah what was that quest going to be about by the way S Sinric is asking oh god i don't even i don't even remember at this point what <laughs> what that was going to be about um yeah it's it's lost on me but doesn't uh, matter yeah. <laughs> a million years ago it's a fun thing and it and i left it in just because i had already built that part of it so there yeah it's so, to everyone's benefit so on a darker note you were part of the disgusting early layoffs at blizzard right after wow shipped which as we now know was done to boost the bonus pool for the top layer of executives at the company um how vile was that betrayal and how did you move past it and um for our listeners, it's important to note that Activision had not bought Blizzard yet when this occurred. Yeah, right. I mean, this was back in the the Vendi Universal days, right? Yep. It's way back. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I think layoffs are hard, right? Like, and I'm sure you've seen several <laughs> of them, right? Even if you're not personally impacted, they've probably happened around you because I've definitely seen that uh, multiple times. Yeah, it was pretty um, gross. After being, being in this one. Um, and yeah, it was really hard, right? Like, I think the the wow team was especially um bonded because we had been crunching right so we saw each other constantly we were all working all the time um and we were having such a great time because we were all working on this thing that we really loved working on and so yeah that was that was a really hard moment for me honestly like it was yeah. probably one of the hardest moments in my whole life to have that happen um if i'm being honest and it took a long time for me to move on past that but um i think as with most things that are hard like that, time is the thing that helps you get past <laughs> them. And very true. Um, especially when I can look at where I am now and say, I wouldn't be here, right? I wouldn't be here talking to you about this with the role that I have, working at the studio I'm out at now, if that hadn't happened. Right. Yeah, it's and very true. There's a lot about those years that I wouldn't give up. Right. If someone said, Hey, you can go back in time and that make, we'll make that not happen. I would, I wouldn't say yes. Right. I yeah. wouldn't say yes to that because, um, there's just the people that I've met and learned from and the experiences that I've had are just, they were really impactful and have helped me get to where I am. And so 
Um, and I don't know if I would have had those opportunities, right? If I had stayed on that team and I never would have left, Definitely right? I was not. that, I was that kind of fan, <laughs> right? I was that kind of Blizzard yeah. fan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I loved working on WoW. I just would have stayed there forever. Right. Like, like, and honestly, a lot of like, people do. like people that we know have, right. That would have mm. been me also. And so I don't know what my career would have looked like. And if I would have been able to, um, you know, have the opportunity to work on, so many different types of games and learn all kinds of things that I just couldn't have learned there. So um, yeah. in the end, I think that's having that perspective years later is the thing that has really helped me. Yeah. I mean, get, getting uh, laid off from Blizzard was basically an instant pay raise. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I, I had a similar experience. It did take me a year to get over it. I was pretty bitter about it. But uh, my circumstances were a little different and individualized, so that might have been why. Um, but uh, moving on, tell you know me what about... I realized we didn't even talk about QA and you writing up, um, you you putting comments on bugs oh, and like right. and like we should totally talk about that. Whether whether we do that now or later on, we should find it. We can talk about it now. Yeah, I I don't know what the experience was in QA, so I'm I'm hearing this for the first time. What? What was it like to get one of my bugs where I just started writing random crap in, in, into them? You were infamous, by the way. Thank you. How, how, how infamous? <laughs> well, and it was always funny to me because, you know, lots of bugs get written up, right? Yeah. And so a certain percentage of those bugs are either like, hey, that's not actually a bug, this, you know, or <laughs> we're not going to fix that, right? Like, and, right. and, you know, like that's just the way it is. And I feel like, like I always used to just enjoy your comments because I felt like you would only comment on stuff if you're like, why did you even write that up? Right. <laughs> and then when I would read the bug, I'd be like, well, I kind of understand why he feels like that. Right. And I would just sort of laugh because I just found it really funny. Um, mm -hmm. And you'd never put anything like that on anything I had written up. Right. So I'd never had the experience of like, hey, I wrote up a bug and then Dave thought it was stupid. <laughs> right. Like I just because typically I was writing up stuff where I was like, well, this feels substantial and should be written up. Yeah. Um, so whether that was luck or I was just great at writing up bugs, I don't know. Um, but there was a point. So here's the here's the story. And I don't know how much of this you remember. Hmm. Um, there were a few of us that had been assigned um, sort of a like a special role in QA um, when uh, Warcraft 3, The Frozen Throne, was it was gearing up to launch, right? And so right, yeah. there were a few of us that were given pieces to really focus on. Um, uh. And there were three of us. And I was given... Um, the campaign missions um so mission flow was essentially what that was called um okay. and scenes and sounds so my job basically when i came in was to try to break the missions so that you couldn't complete them that's what i got ah. to do all day and i'm really good at doing that and i loved doing it and it was super fun <laughs> um i loved that job so much um and so yeah so the bugs that i would write up were really fun because i had to come up with really inventive ways of like okay i've gotten the player into like a like basically like to a point where they can't complete this mission. So they couldn't, they couldn't continue. Uh, um, okay, the only okay. way around that would be to quit that mission and start the mission over. Right. So they wanted all of those things out. Um, one of the other of the, of the two, so it was uh, Matt and Alex. I had gone to Matt because I forget what he owned. I think he owned units. Like that was what he, he was responsible for um, in terms of testing. Okay, so I go to Matt and I say, okay, I haven't tested this. I don't know if it actually happens, but I'm thinking in this mission, I've come up with a scenario that I haven't personally tested, but you could test. And if you want to spend the time to do it, you could write it up. And there was a mission. Is this Toronto? Had... This involves Toronto. This... It was Toronto. It was Toronto. <laughs> oh, I and, know what it is. Uh, yeah, so you remember it. You remember this moment, right? Oh, uh, God, yeah. Okay, so That was, was such Toronto. a terrible bug. And, and essentially, it was like, if you had managed to kill Toronto at this point, like, you couldn't complete the, the rest of the scenario, right? Like, it, you'd you right. just be stuck. And so I said, at this moment, it seems like you might be able to do it. You should go check. He didn't check. He just wrote it up. He wrote it up, like, basically... <sighs> word for word exactly what i told him might work but i said i haven't done it so i don't know that it will actually work he just went and wrote it up um and i still remember that afternoon what came back down was not yeah. just like a, a comment on the bug but you had gone to like some like website that let you make videos yeah 
and like was, you made um, a video about how bad this bug was and i just remember laughing so hard when it came back down because that's all that was in there was like the link so yeah. like basically the comment on the bug was the link to the video um and i just remember matt just like you know just like why did i do this um he and, asked for it <laughs> yeah no given given i'm sure that was a great lesson for him and he's gone off and he's very successful and he works in nvidia and i'm sure he's doing great so i don't I'm think sure it's troubling is. him at all but um it was a really funny memorable moment and um it, it, yeah i'm glad you remember I, now I'm glad i remember, remember it clearly now i remember <laughs> getting the bug and it was like if you kill taronda in this mission with your catapults uh you you, you lose and i'm like that's in the mission <laughs> requirements and uh i immediately remembered this website that you could go to to make like it would take a video of, like like in from an indian movie and uh you could change the subtitles to whatever you wanted because they're speaking hindi so <laughs> no one knows what they're really saying and i just put that in there of like you know uh the guy coming up and when you kill toronto the <laughs> <laughs> the that's mission right. you lose the mission and i'm like that's because that's what the freaking mission says <laughs> and oh yeah yeah i, well, you I couldn't uh, kill her that was the thing you couldn't kill her because you had turned on this thing that like made her health stay up so high even if you were attacking her there's no yeah. way to kill her right so like right. i actually don't know if it was part of the mission i but i just remember that like i went to his desk after this and he was literally he had it set up and he had like 18 catapults and they were all like shooting yes. simultaneously he did kill her he did and, no he couldn't he couldn't oh. he was sitting there at his desk with them with like oh. 18 catapults and he's just like I, I, her health's not going down her health's not but, going down because you had put in that that was like the fail safe in the mission that you had turned on at this point in the it, mission it was Basically, one of two fail safes there's another yeah, one she, if even if he did manage to kill her it would have ended the mission saying taronda died <laughs> Because this, like, I I was super meticulous in these days. So like, I thought of every possible scenario. I <laughs> and so I, so I when I got it, yeah. these bugs that are like, you didn't think of this. I'm like, oh yes, I did. What the hell? So I get really yeah, upset. No. So anyway, just he should have <laughs> tested it before he wrote it up, right? It was totally yeah. on him. But <laughs> he uh, really it was just a really have. funny moment because because basically when the bug came back with that on it, like it took like two seconds for everyone in QA to, to get a hold of it, right? And so everybody <laughs> was watching it and <laughs> laughing about it. Um, and yeah, it right, because really... it was a link, so anyone could just send it around. Oh wow! Then it had the intended effect, I imagine. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was hilarious. And like up until this point, so still like up until this point, I hadn't met you in person, right? Oh, like, yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. Like I'd never met you. You were just like this, like, you know, person. That Nebulous person. Behind, you know, behind the veil somewhere that I, you know, I, I didn't ever actually talk to or meet, um, but that I was quite amused by. It's, it's funny that you mentioned that because there was always that veil because I was in QA and there's all these people upstairs and who are they? I have no idea. And, uh, right, the celestial uh, palace, I believe it was, uh, <laughs> someone referred to it as to me in the beginning. Oh, I see. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Cause yeah. yeah, you know, like it, it was, you know, first floor and second floor. And if you were down in QA or tech support, you were down there. You didn't, you didn't get to go upstairs. You're not allowed to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, it was vile. Actually, it was vile. I did get to go up there once. I was asked to do, oh. um, Chris Sigety came down and he needed someone that um, could do memory testing because there's a memory leak. And uh. um, everyone pointed at me because I was the only one that could play through all the missions without dying. And so that's, but that's the only time the memory leak showed up was if you played a whole bunch of missions all in a row, all those levels, um, then the memory leak Wait. would show up. And so we have a whole QA department and you're the only one who could play through all the missions and not die. Uh, I mean, there were a few people, but they were sort of like, they were more fixtures in QA, right? Oh, so they gotcha. were already leads or something, right? Like I yeah, was yeah, a temp yeah. when this happened. And uh, um, okay, the okay. group of people that I came in with um, were, a lot of them were like, you know, they were still in school. It was their first yeah, yeah, yeah. job. They weren't the most responsible. A lot of them came in and like, hadn't really ever played War 3. And I had yeah. come in after like playing it for like the previous year, right? Um, right. <laughs> and so I was pretty good at it. And so, yeah, they just immediately pulled me. And so I got to go upstairs and I all week I got to just play the game over and over and over all the way through doing, um, they had me doing like this memory dump when the mission started and then when it ended. And so I just did that. Ah, uh, yes. That's when coders have no idea what's going on. <laughs> yeah. 
so that's what they had me do. And so I did get to, I was very, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, I get to go upstairs. Did, but it was really weird because they had this one little computer set up and there was like no one around me. And I was right. just like, okay, I'm just up here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And Chris Siggity would come out a couple times a day and check on me and see how I was doing. But yeah. Oh, you're still alive. Good. <laughs> um, so tell me about uh, Net Devil. Uh, what was it like working there and how did it all fall apart? <laughs> It's interesting that you say that because I, uh, because I, um, NetCivil was very different, right? It was a very different yeah. environment than Blizzard. Um, it was much smaller for one thing, right? There were only about 40, 45 people when I joined, um, working on an MMO, which is sort of crazy, right? When you think about the size yeah. of the team. Um, I don't actually know that it, that it fell apart, but we can, we can get to that. It, it, you might have news I don't or information I don't. No, um, no, I don't. I, uh, <laughs> I was just curious. Yeah. So um, it was, I think it was really challenging for me. Like, I, obviously, like it was only my second role as a designer. And so, and the only environment that I had been in before that was Blizzard. And that was an environment where I felt like I had so much to learn from everyone around me. Everyone just seemed so smart and so good at what they did. And I was just constantly soaking things up hmm. um, that it was really, um, it was really different because I think the knowledge that Blizzard had, I think at that point in time, right, it wasn't like they had created an MMO before, but they had all this live service knowledge that a lot of companies just didn't have because of Battle.net, right? They've been oh, running yeah, Battle.net for years. Yeah, yeah. And so they just, they <clears throat> understood you know, how to run a game like that. They understood challenges they might you know, be faced with. They, they just understood a lot about um, how, to, how to build a game and, and you know, of that kind. And um, so I went to NetDevil and they were not an exception at all because I've worked at plenty of companies, right? Where, hey, we want to make an MMO. We have never done this before. And then you watch them making a lot of mistakes, right? And mm. um, I will say like the guys at NetDevil were great. Everyone is, was really nice. And, um, I was actually, I found that I was listened to in a way that I was never listened to at Blizzard. Right. Like I, I was, you know, I was not the loudest voice in the room ever. I never have been mm. the loudest voice in the room. And, um, at Blizzard, it was really hard for me to find a moment to like, if I was even brave enough to like say something, um, like, mm. Oh, Hey, I have an idea. And I wasn't doing that thing in my head where I was overthinking it and going, Oh, this is a dumb idea. I shouldn't bring it up. Um, which I did a lot when I was, you know, first starting out. Um, at NetDevil, when I would say something, people would actually stop talking and listen, which I hasn't experienced before um, in a design discussion. Um, and I mean, like a lot of them were WoW fans, right? So they wanted to know like, oh, how did they do this? Um, and so that was great. Uh, and I just, I worked really hard though, right? I worked really, really hard. I worked really long hours because I was still really impacted by um, sort of the trauma of that layoff, right? And just having that feeling that the job that you really love can just be taken away from you at any moment. And so I worked really hard because I just, you know, and a lot of times that has nothing to do with being laid off, right? But at the time it was the only thing that I felt like I could, could do. Mm. Um, but that ended up paying off there. Um, and I eventually was, um, we had some people leave and I was moved up to a lead role at one point and I ended up like, I had level designers that like we would meet and we'd get to talk about what we wanted to do. And then we'd get to build stuff. And, um, you know, cause I started out there just doing, you know, you know, more, more quest design missions, mission design, mm. right. Putting missions into the game. Um, so yeah, it was really different. It was a team that was not experienced in making a game like that. In a lot of ways, they were approaching it from a boxed product mentality which is again, super common, <laughs> not unique to them at all. Um, and uh, I don't know, like, I, I think the, the most frustrating thing that, that um, I had to deal with there was just the, the tool set just wasn't it, like, wow, it was so great in so many ways. And it just, there was yeah. a lot of times um, <clears throat> if you could think of it, you know, you could put it in there and usually putting in quest was very fast if you knew what you wanted to do, right? Just the ability mm. to that iteration cycle with wow edit was so fast. Um, and I didn't have anything to compare it to until I went to net devil <laughs> and it wasn't right in order to, yeah. you know, on, on wow, we all, we all had our own kind of like server emulator, right? You remember yeah. like it ran on that second box that you had. And so you could restart it anytime you wanted. Oh, I put something new in, restart it. And then it took, 
you know, five minutes to, to I, get, I didn't get have that, that going. So. Oh, you, you didn't? Oh, well, that's the no. way it worked, right? The ser server emulator that you ran, <clears> that was just yours. You could restart it at any point in time. So if you made new content, oh, you just hit restart on it. It restarts itself. And it was an emulator. Mm. So it's not like it doesn't have to like rev the whole server, right? It just has to, yeah. it was, um, it would spin up areas if you needed them, right? So if you're like, hey, I need to go to Fairloss, it would say, okay, right. I'll spin that up, right? Um, and so it's just this emulator that kind of like it up and down, like anything that you needed to go to it would bring up and it, it would um, take it back down. Um, so it was just really easy to test stuff. And when I got to NetDevil, it was like, well, we restart the server at lunchtime and uh, at the end of the day. So you put content in and you want to test it? Oh my God. And it was, everybody was on the same server. So you couldn't oh just God. say, hey, will you restart the server? Because then you are taking everybody who wants to play the game down. Oh my um, it was God. just stuff like that. It was <laughs> stuff like that where I just, I was like, wow, this is really inefficient. This isn't a great scenario, but that's how they were working. And that's how they had been working, right? Because I came in right at the end of that, right? So I oh. came in right at the end of Auto Assault. Um, it was it was like year, year four, essentially. Yeah. Um, that I came in. And so I was just hired to build it up, you know, put more missions in there, put more content in so that there's something for players to do. And so all these critical decisions and ways of working had long been decided, right? Like there wasn't any changing these things at this point. So yeah, it was just really different. And it was like, a, it was a, uh, there were some frustrations for sure, but it was just a lot of learning moments for me, I think. Yeah, that's, that has to be frustrating. If only basically you get one chance per day. <laughs> That's insane. Mm -hmm. And so I don't even know how I would work in that environment. I guess I'd write out a bunch of different things I wanted to try and then do all of them the first half <laughs> and then see yeah. how, but then it's, you're yeah, just like pretty much what you do. A mass of bugs. Like if the first one doesn't work and then the second one doesn't work, like you're, oh man, that's a terrible, terrible way to work. It I, was hard. I, it was hard. Most companies don't spend enough time on on tools and and the making sure that the creatives have the right tools to get things done efficiently. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of these companies make. Uh, Blizzard yeah, being I'm, one of the good ones, I suppose. Um, I totally agree, and I think <clears throat> I'm, so, I'm always so glad that I had that experience at Blizzard because when I was able to see the how fast it was to get content in, like you get way more content, right? So that's a huge plus, but it's also better because it's so better easy content, and yeah. fast to iterate and the tools are better. They allow you to do more things. Just it's, you know, speed is everything when you have a big game like that, that you're trying to put out there. And um, yeah, definitely invest in, invest in d designer tools for sure. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to find good tools programmers though. That's one of the hardest finds in uh, game development. Um, I don't know why they just don't want to do it. I guess. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. Trek. I find that like uh, you know, occasionally you'll find someone that just really yeah. loves making tools, and then you're like, oh, I'll just keep you forever, right? Yeah, <laughs> you can never leave. But and you try, but then they they get bored. <laughs> like, I I don't know. I've I've had a couple of people they just really like doing that, and so um, uh, have loved and a couple I know of places two. have worked have, have have worked closely with um, someone that just really loves being supportive for <laughs> designers. My track record is two. Brett Wood and... Uh, I, I, uh, I will never argue. They are definitely hard to find, for <laughs> sure. That's two in over 20 years. Uh, anyways, so Star Trek. Uh, it's one of my favorite sci-fi settings. Um, how did you end up working on Star Trek Online? And, and how did you approach the player experience with an eye for the, the tenets of Star Trek's, you know, exploration, empathy, and optimism? So that's... Working on Star Trek is a really interesting chapter, I think, in my story. Um, so I ended up leaving that devil after, you know, auto assault shipped, mm. didn't do that great. Mm. At one point, a couple of months after it launched, NCSoft basically said, we will support a dev team of, I, don't, I mean, I don't know exactly what they said, but we ended up with a dev team of five people, right? Um, which meant there were layoffs and that a lot of people were moved over to um, the Lego project, which had just gotten signed. So luckily, like some people were able to go over to that. But I was one of the five that were left on Auto Assault, and I was, I was the only designer. There was, a, I mean, there's a level designer, but I was the only like designer designer that could work on anything systems related. And when you have a team of five people, there's no updates. There's keep it running is essentially what you do. And so that was um, sort of a depressing place to be. Um, I'm sure that's not surprising to hear. It was 
Um, no. And we did our best <laughs> and we, you know, got in some updates where we could, like we sort of revised the crafting system and, you know, we, where we could, we got things in, but mostly it was just like, what bugs are here today, right? It was essentially mm -hmm. what we were doing. Um, and I, there weren't any, um, there wasn't really a chance of anyone else moving over to the, the new project within like the next nine months. And I knew that. Right. And so mm. it was like, I either do this or I go somewhere else. Right. Yeah. And John Yu was working at perpetual in San Francisco and he reached out to me and he said, Hey, we need someone to handle world design quest design. There's no one here that does that. Let me see if we can get you an interview. So there was no role. They just, he just managed to, get me an interview there. And um, so they made me an offer and I left Colorado and I moved to San Francisco um, and started working on that with him, which was great because, you know, John, you and I, when we were working on, wow, we shared an office. So we were buddies. And um, so it was just really great because I was working right next to him again. And that was really fun. Hmm. Um, and uh, Perpetual had two games. So they had Star Trek Online, and they also had an MMO that was much closer to the point of where they wanted to launch it called Gods and Heroes. So I don't know if you remember Gods and Heroes. Um, everything with um, everything with Star Trek, as far as like how they planned on funding, you know, all of the development that it was going to need was, hey, we're going to launch Gods and Heroes. That's going to support things, and we'll we'll use that to float the rest of this project, right? Um, oh. Mm. Yeah. So <laughs> that would have been great if Gods and Heroes had launched. Right. Um, Gods and Heroes had um, some scaling issues, right? Which for an MMO is just the Death. worst possible problem <laughs> to have if you can't scale and make it viable. Um, mm -hmm. They were really bad scaling issues. Yeah. It would just, after a certain number of players, the, the whole server would just come down. So, <laughs> and this, and this was, um, really close to when they wanted to launch it and they sort of put a timer on it and they said okay if you guys can fix this um before this date we'll move forward and we'll launch and if you can't fix it um which is what ended up happening they so that whole team was laid off and um wow. which was hard um and and you know being on another team so like we don't have any of like the you know the moment to moment of this happening we just kind of go like oh <clears throat> okay, that team's getting laid off today, right? And that was just a very surprising moment. Um, and then it left us in a place with Star Trek Online where it was like, okay, now we need to get more funding for this. And so essentially, um, I one half of my uh, of the time that I was at Perpetual was amazing, right? It was working with John. It was working with the lead writer. It was like watching the shows and pulling stuff out that we really loved that we wanted to have in the game and planning out these amazing sectors and what planets that were going to be in there. And here's the space encounters you were going to have. And here's the stuff you're going to go down to this planet and do. It was just months of that. And it was really, really fun. Sounds like um, a dream job to me. Yeah, <laughs> it was like, I, I still remember just being in, in those moments and going, this is amazing. Right. This is, yeah. And then, you know, and then we hired a um, lead environment artist and so we would meet with him and we would talk to the art director like this is what this area is going to look like here's what we want and it was just exactly the kind of thing that you want to be doing as you know as a game designer just working with this team that's all excited about building something um the other half of my time at perpetual was the road show it was mm. hey we, let's package up um what playable areas we have which was not very much um, and also the tools that we had been working on building as something that we could potentially, you know, entice a publisher with, um, like, hey, look at all this work that we've done. Can you support the rest of development? Right. Um, so I learned how to, you know, and keep in mind, right, this is my third job, my, my third job yeah. as a designer. And I'm basically a little over two years in, right, yeah. after this as a designer. And I'm being asked to demo stuff, right? Go to publishers and demo these tools, right? Um, Impress people. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and sell like, Hey, here's how cool they are. Here's <clears> the stuff that they can do. And, um, after quite a few of those, um, we, um, couldn't get any interest. Um, eventually what ended up happening with the Star Trek license was, um, cryptic studios came in hmm. and took on, like, they basically, I don't, I don't know what the deal looked like for that, but they took on the Star Trek license and anything that we had, any work that we had done, 
Um, and they took everything. They even took the art off the walls the day that God happened. They just, they just came in and they said, we'll take all of the machines. We'll take it, you know, any code that you have. And they just took everything and they went back. And I mean, to their credit, within two years, they had launched that game. So they launched a um, game with Star it's, Trek it's stuff still, in it. <laughs> it's still running. So you know what? Like it's still running. Fair enough. And yeah. So, um, <laughs> And that's a hard, hey, when you're talking about an MMO, that's a really hard thing to do. So A, I was impressed when they were able to launch it after two years. And the fact that it's still running today is pretty amazing. So yeah, um, so yeah, but I don't know if any of what, I've never actually gone in there and played it. Because as you can imagine, that was a kind of a difficult moment in my my career. Um, So I haven't really played that at all. Uh, Um, I tried. Um, I I mean, it's free now to play. But I don't, uh, it didn't really seem to capture star trek or at least the way that i view star trek so um, I, we had a lot of discussions about that actually i think star trek is a particularly hard ip to capture in a game oh very hard yeah um it requires a lot of narrative design and i, I don't think people people don't really approach it that way they approach it as yeah. like a sci-fi shooter sometimes and it makes me angry yeah but. i think a lot of what makes star <laughs> trek great is the characters right and mm. so so yeah, I think it's really difficult if you're going, oh yeah, we're if we're making a shooter, it's you know, that's kind of the opposite thing. You're not gonna end up with something that feels the same. You can have something that exists in the in that universe, right? But yeah. it's not gonna feel like Star Trek. Exactly. That it didn't feel like Star Trek to me. Um, anyway, I'm still I'm still kind of a fan. I don't know if you can tell oh, yeah. what's on my wall back here. Jane Wayne Picard, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you catch uh, the latest uh, Picard? Oh yeah, loved it. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um uh, they, they got it back on track. I was worried for a while. Um, <laughs> anyways, so I have a personal vendetta against EA, as you know, uh, despite never having worked there, uh, mainly because they, they did Oddworld Dirty and uh, screwed over Stranger's Wrath. Um, but so was Maxis a separate entity within EA or was it all like homogenized at that point or, or how did that work? Yeah, so I think that's gone through several changes over the years. Um, when I worked there, even though I was working on The Sims, The Sims was at the um, headquarters, was at the Redwood Shores office. Maxis uh-huh. was in Emeryville, right? So Maxis uh-huh. actually still existed as a separate studio, and they worked on um, SimCity games, and they worked on Spore. Spore. Um, but The That's Sims, right, yeah. they had pulled out because it was honestly just this, such this huge moneymaker for EA. <laughs> they kind of pulled it out, and it was managed <clears throat> separately at the time. I do believe now, if you look at it now, I think they've merged everything back together, but I'm not sure on that at all. I have noticed that they've started using that Maxis name again, which they weren't really doing for The Sims when I was there. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. I know Will Wright left at some point, but did he come back? I don't, mm, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what, what Will Wright's doing. Um, you, you did get to work on The Sims 4, though. Did you get to work with Will Wright, or was he not involved at all? He wasn't. Um, from what I, I believe, he was still at maxis when i joined this is going way back and i'm not sure i can remember but i do think he was still involved with maxis but again that was handled separately when i came onto the sims so he didn't really have any input into what the sims was at that point in time Mm -hmm. um and yeah um so yeah when i came in um for sims 4 um i was the first person that they hired to work on sims 4 um, and this was right after, well, like everything with Perpetual, as you can imagine, continued to go downhill, um, despite our best <laughs> efforts. And I ended up, luckily, I ended up with an offer at EA to work on The Sims, like right, I mean, that just, you know, right as that well, kind of good timing. Close, so yeah, it was very good timing. Um, they actually did a whole, um, you know, how some studios do like a hiring event if they hear a studio is closing. So they did that for us at EA. Oh, um, okay. And so, yeah, so there were people that got jobs on various teams at EA when that happened. Oh, that's pretty cool. Really nice. Um, but yeah, I came in as the fir- first hire on Sims 4. Sims 3 was still in development when I got hired, and yeah. they wanted to make Sims 4 into um, an online multiplayer game, which is why they hired me. Um, gotcha. Yeah. So it was a journey. So, it was a journey yeah, what was, Sims 4. What was it like working on a franchise with, with such high expectations? Um, I, I'm not personally a fan of the, the Sims series, though I have played it. Uh, so I don't even know if this is fair, but The Sims 4 had a, a pretty rough launch, as I recall, and the reception was pretty poor. Um, so do you have any regrets from that game, or is there anything that you got in there that has stood the test of time, or h- how are you feeling about it now? 
So I think the important thing to remember about The Sims is that it has this very engaged fan base. And what happens when yeah. <laughs> um, they move from a base game, so let's say when they move from Sims 2 to Sims 3, Sims 2 has had you know numerous expansions and they have all kinds of content and it supports all kinds of stuff that the base game never did. And then all of that gets reset when the next one launches. And so the response by some of the fan base when that happens is they get upset about that, right? So it's not, it doesn't yeah. really have anything to do with game quality um, at all or, you know, whether or not it's what they were looking for. They're just upset that they lost all that stuff. So that actually always mm. happens. I don't remember The Sims 4 having a, um, a negative reception and they're still producing expansion packs for it. I think it's going strong. The community is usually really engaged. So um, yeah, I think they're still doing really well. In preparation, I, I I watched a YouTube video about the, uh, there's some YouTube, I don't, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she does like crazy makeup. Like, and she did like a Sims makeup with like diamonds on her, on her face, but she went through the entire history of the Sims 4 and like, it seems at launch, it was <laughs> pretty grim and people were pretty upset, but this is her as a fan so she obviously would be part of the group who would be upset that they lost everything that the sims 3 had um but apparently there were a lot of promises that were made that weren't kept and, and things like that yeah um, well i mean given they um i actually have no idea right because i'm not um I, I don't play sims 4 now and so i and i didn't really um check it out right when it launched but um hmm. In general, I think that it, there was a really long development cycle for that, right? Because they were trying to make a different game for the first few years before yeah. they decided, wait a minute, maybe this isn't going to work. Um, <laughs> and we just great. need to put out the single player game that we know how to make. And so I imagine mm. that was hard, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, looks like I'm, I'm sure they're doing fine. The Sims has such an amazing um, fan base Hi. that absolutely loves it. <laughs> so your senior senior designer at Maxis, boom, your creative director of Playfish on Sim Social. What happened? <laughs> uh so that's an interesting story. Um yeah. while I was working on Sims 4, <laughs> EA acquired Playfish in uh in London, in fact, um, because they were really interested in getting into areas where they didn't have as much expertise, right? So they said. Playfish, you understand. This is, this oh is cheating. So, so I'm sorry. <laughs> hi. Um, Say hi. So yeah, so um, they said, Playfish, you really understand Facebook games. We really want to get in on that. Um, so they bought Playfish. Um, and then um, the CEO at the time said, well, you understand Facebook games. We have some great IPs. Why don't you take The Sims? Yeah. you know, one of our best ones and put that on Facebook and we'll see what happens. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's a great idea, right? I totally get why you wanted to do that. And the problem is, is that the Sims is a really Ooh. difficult game to make. And so you can't really just hand over an IP to a team that doesn't understand anything about it and expect a good result. Right. And yeah. it's not their fault. Right. It's just, it's a very, there's a lot of kind of cultural knowledge that you build up as being part of the team that is really, really important to how you make that game um, and, how you, and how you get the feel right. And um, so what ended up happening was they started borrowing people from the Sims 3 team and the Sims 4 team to go over and help with developments. So there were quite a few people that were pulled out for, you know, even months at a time that were then helping with Sim Social. Yeah. Um, and the opportunity came for me on the, the Sim social team. There were no um, experienced designers. And so it was yeah. kind of like for someone to leave. Um, and I had been on the Sims team at that point for almost four years. Uh, and so to have someone that had that um, brand knowledge to come over and just be there full time was that's where the opportunity came in, where they didn't uh -huh. have anyone that had that level of design experience and that level of like Sims um, brand knowledge. And so, so you were like the sort of... apex predator for the Sims. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly how I thought of it in those words. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I got to go over there and, um, join that team and that was, you know, a crazy ride. It was a crazy ride. It was really fun. It was really fun. I mean, working on a live game where you're launching content weekly is a crazy ride, right? Oh, it's weekly. Oh, that's right. Yeah. It was yeah. Weekly. The Facebook stuff was fast, huh? Yeah. How did it, um, 
were you there on the tail end of it? Like how I know it like crashed at some point, like the whole Facebook market died um, all at um, once. Seemingly. I was there from uh, a couple of months right after launch. So that's when I was full time there. Oh, okay. um, and then I, I was on that for eight, eight months or something like that. Um, just doing that full time. What, what really happened, I think with Facebook games is, Yes, I think people were growing tired of them, but there were like a couple of specific changes that Facebook made that made them just completely go away, right? So they made it so oh, right. um, updates didn't appear in your feed anymore. So it wasn't like, oh, this person got a thing in this game, right? Do you remember when you used right. to see those? They yep, pulled those yep. out because people were like, privacy, I don't want people knowing what I'm doing in a game. Because um, so they're doing it during work that, hours. Right, so that went away. <laughs> um, and then the ability to invite people, they reduced your ability i forget what the actual changes were but they reduced yeah. your ability to like spam people with invites to your game essentially right. and once those two changes went through that's when we saw the drop off right just isn't that amazing they yeah they changed the way that like we couldn't it was much harder to reach people right and a lot of that was viral growth that was kind of coming through like hey I, i'm playing this and now i can reach out and get my whole network and they might come in and play right but it was it was pissing off everyone on on Facebook, as I recall, because it was like you would get ten or twenty spams a day okay. to play whatever, like, <laughs> and people were yeah, just mad. Yeah, so I get I get why they <laughs> wanted to make the change, but yeah, it's sort of that was the end of people, you know, playing tons of games on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. I'm, my my assumption has always been that people also got tired of the energy mechanic, and. Uh, just got frustrated with it because it was in every single Facebook game. So, Oh, I've run out of energy, you know, but I was enjoying my time here, but I don't want to pay money for more energy because then I'm just yeah. going to have to pay money for more energy. <laughs> it's just... well, yeah. And also all the data that we had pretty much showed that people are <clears throat> most satisfied with spending money when it's something that they can keep. So really fleeting <clears throat> things like energy that, Hey, I used it up and I don't have it anymore and it's gone. Like I never had it. Yep. Um, those gotcha. purchases uh, that's the highest level of dissatisfaction people will have with a purchase is when it's something like that that goes away so um, and that's that's what the model was so everyone followed yeah. it i don't yeah gotcha is the was the next one that basically took over everything um to this day i suppose um i don't know uh, there's you know games that have definitely done away with that because that's sort of controversial right <laughs> true well, well, we can talk about loot boxes later, I suppose. So, so you moved on to freelancing after that, which, which I'm familiar with. Um, I've always found it a struggle, but how did it go for you? And, and did you find, were you able to find clients quickly and, you know, what sort of services did you focus on or how did you go about that? Um, I actually didn't have much of a, much of a struggle with that. Um, I had people in my network that were, um, they would always reach out to me and say, Hey, do you have time to do this, this thing on the side? Um, and so I went from, uh, I think the first contracting job actually that I had is EA didn't want me to leave, right? When I left Playfish, they said, hmm. will you stay on and contract with us for the next six months? And I said, sure. Um, and so that, I just went immediately from like working there full time into being a contractor. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> um, and so that, that made that, that really easy. <clears throat> um, and then after that, um, that contract expired, I immediately found another with, um, some of the guys that I worked with at Perpetual, right. Mm. The ones that I did the road show with when, yeah, you know, yeah. back when we were trying to, um, shop around our tools and, and Star Trek online, um, in that form. Um, so yeah, they reached out to me and, um, and they had since formed a company and they, uh, so they utilized me as a contractor quite a bit in different roles. So sometimes it was design, sometimes it was as a producer, um, but mm. they were more on the publishing side. So they weren't on development, right? So it was like, we had a dev team that we would, um, work with. And so mm. I was a lot of times kind of like the communication piece between, I was the one that would go in and like talk to them about releases and what they were doing and. Um, and play the build with the team. And then I would bring back a lot of like, here's how it's going, here's what's happening. Um, yeah. And sort of, yeah, I was communicator a lot um, in those days. Um, outside of that, that, you know, I had, I had my son, you know, at, mm. at some point in there. And so I did take some time off. I think I took about six months off. Um, and then after that, I went right back into working with them again. Mm. Um, and that actually lasted a couple of years. Um, and then we had to move to Florida in there, right? So it was like we left California, we went to Florida. Oh, that's um, right. And then, yeah. and that's the only reason I said yes to that move when that when that opportunity presented itself. 
yeah. um, was because if I'm remote, right. And I had been working remotely since um, going independent. Yeah. Um, okay. I can do that from Florida. And so I did. Um, I think there was at one point sort of a three month stretch where I didn't have anything, but other than that, I think maybe I was just really lucky, but I have, you know, a pretty big network at this point and I would just have people reach out and, um, yeah, so yeah. I got to work on a lot of interesting things in that time, yeah. I think. <laughs> VR and, um, yeah, I worked on, um, you know, worked on something for the Department of Tourism for Dubai, right? That was fun. Oh, yeah, you did mention that, yeah. Yeah, all uh, kinds of stuff. So, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was fun. I, just the, the range of things that keeps it interesting, right? Yeah, the freelancing stuff is kind of strange. Right now, I've got, uh, well, for a while, I was deep into NFTs, which is like a whole new realm <laughs> of weird um, companies, mostly run by narcissists. Um, so Scopely then made you an offer you couldn't refuse. Um, how was it living in London? And what was it like working on, you know, a beloved, but perhaps not very deep IP like the Temple Run? Uh, so I, I love living in London. I got, I got to live in London the first time when I was working at Playfish, right? So oh, that's right. Um, yeah. So Playfish is in London. And, uh, this is so your I, third time knew... then <laughs> going to London. Second, second. Yeah. We had that big gap. So like I was in London, went back to California, oh. I went to Florida and then now we're back. So, okay, um, okay. yeah, so we've been here since, um, Scopely is great. Um, I went to Scopely because there were people that I had worked with on the Sims um there and so ah. that's it was a that connection you know got you know the the role was opening and it was sort of like hey we, we think you'd be good for this i want you to come and interview so um when i interviewed everything was still so under wraps they didn't tell me what the game was they didn't even tell me what the genre was <laughs> um i sort of took it at as like hey i would you know they pretty much told me hey we're working with a dev team that's in london so you need to move to london to do this and i said i'm in right okay. um and then after i got the job i found out that it was a match three game um and that was a temple run license um yeah. which luckily i like both of those things um and i have played yeah. a ton of match three games so so it ended up being a really good fit um working on temple run i think trying to translate it into a new genre is really like just a big challenge right like it um a game like that people remember it for that like you know high speed you know sort of like tense kind of play where you're like you know, <laughs> yeah. trying to make decisions really quickly um it, it that's a specific type of player right and in many ways i feel like match three sort of draws this player that wants to kind of casually interact with a game and they, they use it for you know maybe to relax in the evening and it's just a really yep. different style of play so i think the recognizability of something like temple run is great um i i think it was just a challenge to figure out how to um how to make it right for that for the audience that we knew liked match three games right yeah. um so, yeah, but I mean, as far as um, working on it, the the guys over at Amanji are great. Um, yeah, Keith, Keith and Walter, they were super easy to work with and they were really flexible and just really, yeah, that, that relationship was really great. And they were really open. I would be like, hey, here's what the narrative team wants to do. Are you, are you cool with this? And most of the time they would just, yeah, we'd just all talk about it. And yeah, so. Did, did, was there deep lore for the game, like beyond what's what's in the? They have some. Right. And they would okay. they pretty much provided everything that they had to us so that we could sort of build on that. Um, yeah. We wanted to put a, um, a story into the game because a lot of really <clears throat> successful match three games, they they tend to have a story that the players yes, really do. enjoy following. June's Journey. And so <laughs> Yeah, June's Journey or like Lily's <clears throat> Garden, that kind of mm. that kind of thing. Right. Um, homescapes. Uh, oh, all God. these games have like a little story that you're following. And so we wanted to do the same sort of thing. And so kind of coming up with a story that we felt um would interest that particular audience but still in in the world um was you know that was basically the challenge there um but yeah i, R I think we figured it out yeah it was fun yeah it was really fun and um <laughs> and yeah i don't know it was, it was a it was a great great experience cool um so <laughs> here's the question media molecule kind of notorious as a free-spirited studio i had a brush with them when i worked on little big planet beta um in sweden but at the time they basically told us to do whatever we want um so what was it like working as a franchise design director and, and what did that role entail and, and how did it go 
Um, so yeah, I think your, your instincts are correct. They are like, I, I, I'd say that that studio is probably, um, the most creative group of people that I've ever worked with. Um, and they just really get who they are as a studio and they just really understand yeah. their brand. And I think and it's something that I think is just really appealing and it's fun and it's wacky and weird. And they've kind of really carved out their own space. Um, a franchise design director, um, it just kind of means like, it's kind of like it's at studio level. Like if you had an IP yeah. and it kind of went off into multiple directions, maybe multiple games, um, mm -hmm. that's kind of what that would entail. So, so yeah. Uh, so fan, we're on the fan questions, guys. Uh, we've got a set from people from my server. Um, and if you haven't joined my discord yet, uh, you probably should, if you want to get in ahead of the rest, uh, question number one. Uh, wow quests like the ones in the barrens where you where after you kill the centaurs a counterattack comes with npcs clashing until an elite comes and drops a flag as well as the one in ashenvale where orcs assault a night elf base really made the world come to life were those part of the quest systems and why weren't there more of those that is a great question um and those that functionality is n not necessarily part of the quest system um, and who knows what it looks like now, but I can just tell you when I was there, um, that was actually part of like the early part of the event system going in that was being tapped into there um, to, to, to make those quests. And um, those are Pat Nagel, by the way. Pat Nagel did counterattack. Oh, um, Mr. Pat Nagel. Yeah, yeah he's he was a good always guy. the one that like, he would look at functionality that went in and then figure out a way to use it, right? That was always what he mm. did. Um, he was always angle. the one too. If, if I wanted to... <laughs> I would get an idea for something I wanted to do. I would just go into Pat's office and I would explain it to him. And he and I would sit there and he would say, okay, here's how you can do that. There are a couple of ways. Here's what you can do. And then I would go and go back to my office and be like, awesome. Um, so he was so great like that. But yeah, counterattack was Pat Nagel. And um, yeah, it, that functionality just came in really late. So it's not something we actually had the ability to add to any, any quests. And again, it's not really part of the quest system. He was just sort of using it um, uh. and sending an event at the end, which completed the quest which is how we did escorts too, right? Hacks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it works. Pat, Pat was good at the hacks, right? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. Was, he was crazy. Um, why do escort NPCs in WoW walk slower than a player walking backwards? <laughs> Yay, let's talk about escort quests. Yeah, um, let's, let's talk about them. <laughs> so, yeah, <clears throat> escort quests, right? Um, they just... I don't know. Everyone has, I think, passionate feelings about escort quests, and usually they're not joyful um, yeah. feelings. Not, not terribly um, positive. <laughs> yeah, I think in, initially um, NPCs were put on walk sometimes because if they were put on run, then you would have to run to keep up with them. Mm -hmm. um, and they just didn't want that happening. It was so that like, if you got attacked by something, you could still stay within a reasonable distance because when escort quests were first put in, the NPCs wouldn't pay attention to anything that was happening to you. They were set on a path and they would walk on that path. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. And so it's like, oh, I've been started along here. Now I'm going to walk and play out my actions because that's how like NPCs, you know, any actions that you put on an NPC, they basically like, if they get triggered, they play from start to finish, right? They don't, mm -hmm. you know, there's, and if they, if they get interrupted, like if they get attacked, that's the only time that, that anything could interrupt those actions. And then when they're over, I'm sure everyone has seen it. You have like a, a so like a mob you're escorting, and then initially they they they're walking, they get attacked, they go into combat mode, and then as soon as they come out of combat mode, they go running back to that spot that they were at, or really yep. fast, boop, back to that spot, right? They kind of leash back, and then they, oh, I'm going to carry, I'm going to carry out my actions. Yeah. Um. And so initially they were walking because then if you got attacked, and they then they wouldn't like run off, right? Because you'd never catch them if they were running at your speed. Yeah. Um. And I will tell you a story about. That I didn't like that either, um, surprisingly <laughs> or unsurprisingly. Um, so one day I went to um, Sam Lentinga, um, who yeah. you also know, and yeah. I said, hey, this is, is there any way that we can make NPCs actually respond when you get attacked? Because it's kind of annoying that they don't, and it's really kind of like immersion breaking that they don't seem to care. <laughs> like you're helping them. You're like going out of your way to be like, yes, yeah. I'll help you get this place. And then you're getting attacked and they're not, and they just walk off. Um, and he was Why like, do they okay, hate me? Well, yeah, like, <laughs> let's talk about what we can do. And essentially what we uh, managed to, to do was to 
he made it so that like you could give, and I mean, they had this anyway, like any um, NPC had an aggro radius, Mm -hmm. but basically he made it so that you could use that radius and it would, it was essentially like a call for help. If you got attacked, it would, it would Mm -hmm. be watching and within that radius. And if you got attacked, it would interrupt and, and it would put that NPC into combat. So he would, he or she would fight with you. Mm. Um, and we talked it through and he said, okay, the, you know, kind of the other thing that this is going to cause is if you're doing an escort quest and there's another player that's fighting something that this NPC then walks through, well, they're going to stop and help there too. And I said, I think we're willing to accept that, you know, as a side <laughs> effect because it's better than them completely ignoring. Yeah. Um, and he said, okay put the change in and it's been that way. Right. So in wild classic, that is why like, but they have to be set up properly. Like the NPC in order to do that has to be set up with that aggro radius to do that. Right. Um, and so if you still see an escort quest in classic that isn't behaving that way, it's because the, the quest designer didn't put the aggro radius on the, um, on that NPC for whatever reason they forgot, or they just, you know, didn't want them to do it, but, um, managed to change it a little bit so that it made it slightly better than it was. Um, yeah. It's just funny because there's so many things like that that happened on WoW where it's like, that didn't go into a task. That, you know, no <laughs> one was tracking that. No producer knows we had that conversation. That was me just wandering into Sam's office and saying, do you think we could fix this? Yeah. And that's, it's unique to Blizzard, I would say. But that's how a lot of things got fixed. Actually, some of the companies that uh, I had the best experiences at were ones where that would happen all the time. Like Oddworld was one of those where it, oh this this thing isn't working quite correctly and you just sort of sidle over to the programmer's desk like the lead programmer and go do you know anything about this and he would obsessively work something out and fix it <laughs> um yeah um and sam was great like that he was always up to have a conversation like that about how to make something better and hmm. i think in many ways he's he's the one that sort of trained me how to talk to programmers like the way to present a problem and how to talk through a solution um, and he was ever so patient with me. It was, was a unique language. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, I know we talked about the Lincoln quest earlier. Uh, what, what quest did you design for wow? And are there any fond remembrances therein? Um, so the zones that I did, uh, fair loss, which we've mentioned, uh, winter spring, hinterlands, Tenaris, Ashenvale, uh, I did a couple of quests in the Night Elf starting area, Teldrassil, and then yeah. um, I did a couple in the Barrens when like it was like, hey, we need to fill in some quests. And I was like, well, all right, quests in the Barrens, right? <laughs> Barons. Are you a Night Elf um, purist? <laughs> I, just, I think I just love the way people hate the Barrens, so I love it because of that. Yeah, I wrote most of my quests there, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, like quests that were in there. And a lot of times it's not like I, I or Ungirl, sorry. Ungirl was the one I left off the list. Um, oh, yeah. A lot of times we, um, you know, we would be paired up. Like two quest designers would be given a zone to quest. And oh. so for any one of those zones that I mentioned, I didn't do, you know, I may or may not have done a quest that you can remember in that zone. But um, yeah, those are the ones that I, oh, Felwood. Did I mention that one? Felwood's on the list, yeah. Longer list. Oh, Felwood, yeah. Creepy. Yeah, Felwood. <laughs> Creepy. Yeah, so um, I did the quest in, in Felwood where you, <laughs> it was it was appropriate for the NPC. Um, you take a kitten <laughs> and you put it in the um, the corrupted moon well. This is, yeah, you get, this oh, you is drown like a, a kitten. quest. You don't drown it. You put it in the corrupted moon well and it turns into the battle cat from he It's like green, oh. like the battle cat, and then it follows oh. you and you take it back. Yeah, I remember that one. The only reason I made that quest was because someone had made that texture and I was flipping through the textures on the tiger and you and found battle, made cat. The battle cat and I found <laughs> it and I'm like, I have to use that for a quest. And I had sort of like pocketed it. Like I have to find a place where that will make sense. And then, Do, you know, what did, you name it? Per- what did I, what did I name it? That was it Gronger or something? Cause I know it wasn't like cringer. It was, it was something similar. It was something similar. It was something, it was something I similar. I, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Turtle Wow's gonna know. Come on, guys. Yeah. I see them in the yeah, chat. They're, they're gonna tell us. In a um, um. Anyway, so, so yeah. But I found a place, right? So it made sense. If you took a kitten and you put it in this green, glowing green moon well, it would turn yeah. into that, right? No, that's a great quest. Um, yeah. F- from the quest you made in WoW, were there any that got rewritten after you left and fundamentally changed the original intent, meaning, or theme? Um, I think everything changed with um, 
Cataclysm. Uh, yeah, with Cataclysm because yeah, everything yeah, yeah. got pulled out, right? So I think every quest that I had done got pulled out with Cataclysm. <laughs> Like, I don't know if any of them were still there. Maybe in the Night Elf starting area. But then, but again, they probably, you know, redid that. I don't know. Um, so it was really great to, you know, when Classic came out, because it was like, they're all back. There they are, right? Yeah, I know. Um, I think the only thing that stayed was, because um, they pulled out, obviously, the whole, and I mean, I get why they wanted to pull out the, the Zelda tribute quest, because, you know, it's, you know, a fine line between an homage to something and eh, maybe we're crossing the line there. Yeah. Um, so I get why they wanted to take it out. But um, <clears throat> Lincoln... Um, was put into another quest. Eric Malouf put him into another quest in in like a zone way later. He like appears as an NPC and um because and I and I played it and I saw him and I'm like who did this? And I had to go yeah. find out who did it, but it was <laughs> it was um actually I think Ringo stayed now that I'm thinking about it. I think his quest was huh. changed a little bit, but huh. I do think he stayed. Um and I think it was all Eric Malouf who like, you know, he went in yeah. there and he like changed some things that needed to be changed. But a lot of the stuff he did leave. And I was like, oh, he, he preserved. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. Um, a more general quest question. Uh, when you're starting from the blank canvas for a quest, where did you go for inspiration or what was your process like? And what sort of phases did you go through to refine it into a final uh, re releasable quest? Yeah, so I think um, for every designer you ask this question, they're going to say something different. But yeah, <laughs> for me, I always started with what would what's something that would be fun to do. So I always started mm. with mechanics versus story. I would find a story that fit whatever I wanted to do later. Mm. But I would start with like, what mechanic do I want to have as part of this quest? And then I would focus everything around making that work. Mm. Um, so I realized that's not it's not super complicated, but it's you know like how I ended up with. Um, you know, things like I have, um, like the Ringo quest, I think is a good example of that, right? I just kind of <clears> came up with, I want to have this escort quest feel more interactive. Why would this NPC stop following me? Right. Right. And sort of ask that question and then follow that and see what answers I can come up with for that. Yeah. Um, and sort of have him fainting while Ringo is fainting. There's another quest that's just like that in, um, in Feralos where, you, you're escorting this night elf who's just kind of a space cadet and she just kind of forgets she's supposed to be following you and she wanders off you have to get her um you have to yeah she oh, comes is that back a dryad? If you, if, it's just not a dryad she's just a night elf anyway there's like a oh. bell you can get an item that's a bell and when she hears it she remembers she's supposed to be following you um <laughs> all right yeah so yeah so she comes back but um uh, that's pretty good no, that's a good place yeah, to start. But just stuff, yeah, just stuff like that. And then I would, and like I said, I would just find a story that would then fit the thing that I wanted to do um, hmm. and then figure out how that would work as a quest, right? So yeah, the writing was always the thing I did last. I would actually get everything functioning, yeah. even for like a multi-step quest. I would get it all working and all of the, you know, all of the quest texts would just say like, you know, which text TV, goes here TV, 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 right it would say yeah <laughs> so something goes here um or i would kind of just write one sentence about like what was supposed to happen hmm. um and then the last the very last thing that i would do on any quest once it was working so i would go in and i would write all of the text for every single step wow yeah it's like the total opposite of the way that i approached it <laughs> i always started with the narrative and the story and then the mechanics came from whatever uh, i felt pushed the story forward um but there's no right answer here. It's whatever works. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. Uh, it's just kind of whatever works. I think just that's just how kind of how my brain works. Um, yeah, the mechanics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for WoW, what were the primary goals of the quests? Uh, what were they supposed to accomplish? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think <laughs> quests kind of serve the same purpose in any game that they're in, which is sort of like you, you basically have this this grind, right? There's a couple of things that they do, right? There's this grind of like, hey, I need to progress in this game and I do that by gaining experience. How can we make that more interesting or wrap that with narrative that feels compelling and interesting and gives context to the world that you're in? Mm. Um, so I feel like they do serve that purpose. Well, it's much more interesting than just going out and like, okay, I'm going to fight these things until I level up, right? With <laughs> absolutely no purpose other than like, I'm watching my experience bar go up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, th I feel like that's, that, that's the purpose that they really served. And wow. I mean, I, I think Kaplan always used to say that quest designers were cruise directors, right? So you think about like, how can I make this experience fun for you? You've, you've, you've come onto this, 
you know, you've come along on the trip. How can we make it really fun for you while, you, while you're here? And I think that's a good way to think about it. Mm. Um, I, I've always liked that comparison. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think also, which I guess I've mentioned is sort of like, I think it adds depth to the world. I can get pieces of story or understand something about one of the recurring NPCs that's in the game. Um, mm. And there are players that get super into some of the stories, like the the ongoing <laughs> stories that are in the quest lines and they get really upset if like they, yeah. they stop short, like you've never finished this quest line. What happens, right? Um, uh-huh. There's a few of them in the chat right now. Yeah, it's always <laughs> fun, 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 you know, and because I think the one thing that we really knew, um, the one thing that we were very, very honest about um, as, as a, being on the quest team was we knew that a lot of players didn't read the quests. Right. We knew that we accepted that we were completely okay with that. Um, and it was really just about like, you can play this however you want. If you want to read this quest and totally get into it and follow the story, you can do that. And if you don't want to, we're completely fine with that too. And we'll make it easy for you. Right. We'll give you a one sentence quest description about what you're supposed to be doing. Right. Yeah. We'll tell you what you're supposed to be killing or what you're supposed to be picking up. Um, and so it was always, that was always the goal. Um, just giving players options, right? Did you succeed? <laughs> Did you succeed? Well, I guess you ha- just have to look at like, you know, how many people have, have played WoW are still playing WoW. Yeah. <laughs> I think if it's a question of could we have been more successful? Yeah, I think the more functionality you get in and like the more, the, the larger range of things that you can do, right? Which has definitely happened over time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. S- speaking of which. When you were creating quests, uh, did they have to fit into the Warcraft lore or could you come out of left field with something that might be considered off-brand? Off-brand, no. I think Metzen would have immediately caught that and said, that's off-brand. I think it was much looser early on. Yeah, definitely. Than it is now. <laughs> now, it is, now it seems like it goes through a lot more um, checks and it does seem to really dive heavily into the story and lore. Um, mm-hmm. I was playing the most recent expansion and they've really gone like they're, they have you very, very focused on um, the game lore, right? And all the quests yeah. and they've got these big cinematic moments in them now. And um, so it's actually changed quite a bit. Um, but as far as like, could you write something that didn't have anything to do with that? Well, I mean, I, I think there's still quests like that all the time, right? Like we just put stuff yeah. in that was just fun. It doesn't necessarily go against the brand or the existing lore, but it just wasn't really in support of it either. It was kind of just, hey, I'm just this one-off thing that you can do. That's fun. Um, the only time yeah. I can remember there being an issue was right after the game. It was either right before the game was going to launch or right after it launched. Um the whole quest team was given a, like a talking to for putting too many like pop culture references in the game. Oh, I um, remember so that controversy. So there yeah. was a moment <clears throat> where we, we were sort of like, we need to stop doing that. Um, and they're still in there, right? You still see them. There's yeah. kind of things here and there. I just think like maybe we had been doing it too much. And so we were like, I know, take, I know take Kaplan was the biggest cul- culprit of that one. Yeah. <clears throat> take that down a notch. So what are the boring or unnecessary things that a lot of quests do that you wish could be removed? You're asking a game designer this, by the way. I know. Um, <laughs> Sometimes yeah, stripping yeah. away the parts that uh, you don't like is the hardest part of game design. <clears throat> That's a really hard question. Um, hmm. Because I think it is like, I don't know that there's a right answer to this question because that assumes mm-hmm. that everybody finds the same things boring or unnecessary, right? And I think that's a really hard thing to put your finger on, especially when it comes to game content. Um, so I'm, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a really hard one to, to answer because then the next place that I go with that is sometimes you need the, the change of, of pacing. Sometimes you need parts in there that you don't like as much to appreciate the parts that you do like, right? You need actually yeah. to see those things against each other. Um, I'd say just in general, like I think if this question is really intended to be about, hey, how could Quest be better in yeah. a game like WoW? Approach it that um, way. Yeah, I, I think I think we're, we've seen a lot of those things come in, right? The NPCs now all have like 
they all have voiceover, right? They yeah. all, and, and I'm sort of like torn on like, does this make it better? Does this make it more immersive? I'm sure there's people that love it, right? Um, yeah. But then it takes longer. Like if you if you want to be polite and stand around while this person talks to you, okay, you can do that. It is faster if I just read it. Which one's better? That's totally personal preference, right? Totally, um, yeah. I think uh, just in, in general, I, the 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 thing that is most challenging, I think, for an MMO to deal with, and you know, wow, it, the design team has tried to like has definitely approached this a certain way, which is you're sort of in a world with all of these other people, but a lot of the game is sort of set up so it's about the story that you're in, yep. right? With the phasing, right? So they they use phasing to kind of say like, well, you're the hero in the story. Um. And that balance is something that like, I think it's impossible to get that right. Right. Like yeah. are you doing it too much. Or are you doing it? Not enough. I don't know. Um, I do think the one thing that I would love to see in, in an MMO is really like just more of how can we lean into all of these players are in the same space. How can we create kind of dynamic or emergent stories that are happening for that group of players yeah. in the space that they're in? Like, I would love to see something like that. And I feel like there's definitely been attempts at that i'm actually Guild hoping that with yeah absolutely um and they're all limited in some way right um yeah. it's kind of like okay well this works in some ways and not in others but um i'm actually really hoping that with um all of the advances in ai that we start to see more stuff like that because that's the thing that could make it possible because really before now it's been a question of the cost of creating either yeah. a system that can handle that or creating the actual content itself that can handle that. Like it's just such a, it could be a very costly endeavor, right? Trying to get that right. It, um, it is for sure. It, a lot of it is just that like we should go back to the tabletop RPG roots, I think sometimes and consider how we do things there. And a lot of it is communicating with individual players. And then how does, how do they communicate with each other? And so one of the ideas I had for like how Baldur's Gate 3, for example, might have been able to pull it off where you're playing multiplayer, but everyone's doing their own individual things and like not everyone's interacting with the same story is then you have a campfire scene at the end of each segment or whatever the case may be, the end of each night, everyone sits down by the campfire to rest. That's part of D&D. &D, and then they have to relate the information that they got over the, the course of that segment to each other and they can choose how to do that. And that's part of the role playing element where the rogue might withhold information. The bard might embellish some things. And, um, I just, no one's ever approached that <laughs> or thought about it in that way. And I think that's, I, I don't think that it's not, I don't think that it's impossible. I don't even think it's necessarily that hard. I just think no one has approached it with like that multiplayer narrative in mind <clears throat> yet. Yeah, I think a lot of the, um, when you're playing a multiplayer game, like an MMO, it's in the little moments, right, mm. that the social bonds are built. It's in, you know, I grouped with a player for five minutes to try to do something that I couldn't do by myself. Um, yeah. It's, hey, I looted this item off of off of this guy and I can't use it, but maybe you can because it looks like it's for your class. It's in the little moments like that, I think that need to figure out if you're making a multiplayer game how to inject it full of little moments like that yeah i i think that when we we were working on wow we sort of became a machine that was producing single player content for a multiplayer <laughs> game when there could have been things where you put two people on a quest and then um match make them effectively and when they phase into the cave they're, they meet up there and have to do different things, but they're sort of working together. Like you can tell different stories to each player and then they come into the cave and there's just all sorts of interesting ways that we could have done it that we just never got to because we were so busy <laughs> getting the content done um, to meet the deadline. Sure. I think WoW Classic is actually good at, at, at those little moments, honestly. Um, it has more of them than know, I think they do now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, or even, you know, sort of moments that people look back on and say, well, that was kind of a pain when I had to do that, right? Like getting a group together for yeah. a dungeon, right? And classic was like, Hey, let me go in the middle of Ogremar and I'm going to yell for a while and see who will join my group. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then we have to, <laughs> once I do that, then we all have to get over there to the dungeon, which is like, okay, is that going to take like an hour for all of us to get over there? Maybe it will. 
And yeah. then once you get in there, you have no idea, even if your group is going to be good enough to be able to complete the content in there. Right. Typically um, not. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so people think back on that and they're like, Oh, it was really hard. I hated doing that. But like all of those moments are social moments, social right? moments. Yeah. And so they're not necessarily a, a net negative when you look at them like that. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Are there a little, you know, are there small changes that you can make to make that better? Probably. But I think it, yeah. honestly, that is the social moments that you get out of that versus like the dungeon finder, right? It's taking yeah. all of those moments out. And They're so you're, you're missing all that potential, it, like building relationships with other players. It, it, so. Worse than that, it turned it into a job. So the dungeon's a job, you do your job. And that's it. And then you're done and you never see these people again. Whereas like there were small things that we could have, that could have been done instead of the dungeon finder. For example, if a group of five goes in, you can just adjust some of their levels so that they're not, you know, so that their effective damage output meets the requirements if they're DPS and things like that. They do that but, now. Oh, they do. But then mm -hmm. they've already gone too far. So, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah, they have this really interesting dungeon scaling thing where like you can go in with your group and the dungeon scales. I will say it doesn't uh, always work perfectly, but it does work fairly well. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it, it does. I don't know. It's very weird, though, because it makes it really hard to understand. Like your actual damage that you do as a player will drastically change if they scale you into a dungeon. Like it's so weird. Right. Yeah. Um, so that was really confusing because I did, actually didn't the first time I experienced it. I had come back to WoW after a really long break. And so when I started seeing that happening, I was like, what's happening? How does this even work? <laughs> yeah. um, it is kind of neat, though. Um, it is, I think, the one thing that I really wanted to see happen for WoW um, was being able to reuse content at, like, it, it, like reuse dungeon content, right? So, like, people would play dungeons, and then they would just be done, right? And yeah. I would always think that like, hey, if there was a way that they could reuse that maybe by scaling it up, right? Like, oh, I'm much higher level now, but yeah. I can go back to that dungeon and all the content scales for me. Um, and I'm really glad that they finally got around to doing that at a certain point, right? Because oh, I they think did. it, um, yeah, I think it oh, like, okay. it really adds a lot to the game. And yeah, and the whole, like the mythic dungeons thing is um, a really great add, you know? Oh, that that's right. Yeah. I do remember yeah, that now. So, so yeah, at first they added like a heroic level in dungeons, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, they've added all this like scaling stuff, but also just mythic is like, that's an interesting thing because it's, um, it becomes really aspirational for people. Mm -hmm. Like most people can't play at the level of, you know, once you get <laughs> so many, so many levels in the mythic, like you have to be so good and to have the exact right gear that most people aren't going to be successful Impossible. doing that. Possible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but me. there's the aspirational part of it right where you're like oh i want to get that good i wish to be able to do that right um, yeah and that's that, i think that's a really important part of social games as well is to have those moments in there where you're like wow those players are really good and maybe if i keep playing i'll be that good yeah no i won't uh, <laughs> did you uh put any the easter dream. eggs the dream dave <laughs> did you put any easter eggs into any of your games that have yet to be found have yet to be found I don't know. I mean, I put plenty of like, you know, silly pop culture references into my, hmm. my quest in WoW. Um, but I don't know if any of them haven't been found. I haven't really hidden anything that I, you know, that was super deep. The, I was funny because I was looking for uh, the, the picture to put in the thumbnail of the Lincoln quest. And I found a Reddit where they were talking about the quest. And uh, it, this is their, the comments are six years old, by the way. Um, but one person was noted that the ape was named for the Kevin Smith movie, Chasing Amy. That was Michael's quest. Michael put that in and he absolutely uh, made it for that, for that movie. Yeah. And, and it was the first time they had realized that despite having done the quest several times on several characters. <laughs> I was just like, oh. I mean, the name of the quest is Chasing Amy, isn't it? Like, it's like Chasing but, Amy-01 or something like that. Yeah, like, it's yeah. It's literally he, the name of the movie. But he apparently had been reading it as A-M something <laughs> instead. Well, good. I'm glad. Those little moments of discovery are fun. So. <laughs> That have it. Yeah, I think the, the funniest thing about um, Easter eggs is, especially with something like the Lincoln Quest, when I've seen people attempt to break that down and say, here's all the references in this, they find stuff that I didn't know about. I'm like, oh. wow, that's that's cool. I, just, I, I don't remember doing that. Awesome. I'm so glad that you think that that's a reference I put in there. 
Um, so there's sort of like fun moments too that players, I mean, you know, there's like players will read into everything that they find too and deeply invent yeah they will like invent lore in their head about why something's happening or how it works or it's just another one of those things they'll invent entire mythologies that just never happened and i've uh i've spent the last couple of years breaking down some of those and why that's not the case but uh let's go to our chat here and intra asks curious what your thoughts are on making the player feel important in the game narrative versus having a sense of being a humble small piece of a big world i think you can do both of those things yeah um, i think so i feel like you know like the the hero's journey is something that like pretty much every human will respond to yeah. um and that literally is sort of being like hey, I don't understand this new world that I've gone into and I feel like I'm not equipped to be here and then building into, you know, I've got this and, and becoming that hero. So I think that's just a really compelling story every time that we see it. Yeah. Um, and those are especially rewarding when you're the underdog, right? You're the underdog. Mm. No one expects you to be able to do it and you're, not, you're never going to win, right? All the odds are against you. Um. As far as like which which one's more important, you can have both of those things. I don't know if you have to say that one's more important. Um, I do think if but, you're, especially if you're telling a story in a game, yeah. you should there should be some aspects of those things, both of them. Well, I feel like WoW kind of fell into the trap of like, all right, you've come up and now you're at this level, and now it has to get more epic. Oh, and here's a new expansion. Now it has to get more epic. Oh, and here's a new expansion. Now you're just killing gods with like one pinky. Like <laughs> at some point it gets a little bit out of control. And, and I think players miss that feeling of being a part of a world as opposed to being effectively a god killer <laughs> in every instance. Yeah, I think it's, I think that's really hard, but I, I mean, it's a, I would argue that we sort of see the same thing in a lot of, series where like the sh of like a show right where like series yeah. one is you're sort of you see that hero's journey of like this character that starts out with with nothing and no knowledge and then sort of builds into the hero over the course of that that um season and then they're like okay season two well, what do we do now right um yeah. what do we do now and it usually like involves the story getting way more complex and there's all these layers and all these additional characters added because they're trying to keep things interesting because they don't have that natural um progression yeah. that hero's journey format gives you um it's true. yeah I, I think i think it's really that's it's really hard right it's just really hard to keep that up and um i mean my hat's off to you know the the lore team that has to keep track of you know almost 20 years of of wow lore and have to say every, all right well that slain. doesn't that thing you wrote <laughs> doesn't fit with these three other things that occurred you know yeah, Five 10 years ago and eight and 10 years ago so <laughs> let's sit down and talk about them right i'm kind of just like yeah i don't know if i could have that job right i don't know if i could keep all that in my head and be able to remember all those things and uh, so i think that's the challenge right is sort of they've got the world they've got they've got the format they've got you know i'd be totally up for seeing stories that we haven't seen in, in wow right but i think it's sort of like it is this good versus evil sort of story it's, um, it's just gone super cosmic at this point so like <laughs> every time you defeat something and it's like, well, oh, I was just warning you about the real threat, the bigger threat. It's like, oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I hear you. I hear you. It, yeah, that, it's a definite challenge. I mean, I I think this, the, you know, the quest team, I'm sure, takes on a lot of that of like, you know, how are we keeping this interesting? What unique things can we do here? And are there any new mechanics that we haven't been able to do that we would really like to see so that we have something new that we can throw at people, yeah. right? Yeah. Cause, yeah. Well, I I always worry that you get stuck in the, the formula. It's like, because you can always break it down to like, what are the four main types of quests? It's like, you know, pumpkin, you know, travel, uh, what is it, delivery? And what are the other two? There's two more, isn't there? Uh, anyways, but you get the idea. And FedEx. The FedEx, FedEx. yeah there's only so many variations of those that you can do before it's like you know deliver this letter to god god man the 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 world killer and uh it's like what am i doing uh, and why aren't you delivering this letter yourself yeah what the f <laughs> <laughs> i mean you've got there's magic just teleport it over there <laughs> there's a mail system in this game should i show you the mailbox <laughs> <laughs> precisely um 
What's your favorite Star Trek captain? <laughs> Janeway. Janeway? Yeah. I, I think I'd go with Picard, but I'm a next gen. Picard's pretty amazing, but the challenge that he yeah. was up against was nothing compared to Janeway, which is why I always go to her. I love Picard, by the way. Oh, yeah. Janeway had to keep it together in like a hopeless situation for for yeah. years. <laughs> and she didn't she didn't give up and she had two sides that were essentially enemies that she had to put together into one crew. Like Oof. Yeah. yeah. Rough. Uh what were your favorite memories from Blizzard? Favorite memories from Blizzard. Uh, we definitely already talked about one of them was that moment in QA that we talked about. <laughs> that was hilarious. Ha um, happy to be a part of that history then. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um getting my job on the WoW team. Mm -hmm. Um I think that was that was sort of it, it was a moment where it was unexpected and I did something really dumb in the in the moment. And so it was just it's just this kind of funny story. Um there were I don't know if were you still around at the at, at that time when they were hiring quest designers onto the WoW team? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was like, and you know, like everybody in QA and tech support applied for those roles when they went up. Like it was just ridiculous. Yeah. And so those of us that actually got interviews for those roles felt really lucky. Mm. I felt like I totally bombed the actual interview. Although the written test, I felt like I had done pretty well, right? They had to do some actual quest design. And because I was on the strike team, I knew what the game could do, right? So yeah. I wrote quests that fit, that it was very clear that you could actually build these in the game and put them in and that they would uh. work. So I felt like I had done that part well, but the interview, I was just like, okay, that was just the worst. Um, there's no way that this is going to go any further. Um, and uh, then one night I was, I was in QA and my, uh, my phone rang um, and I thought it was the guy that I was dating at the time because he usually called me around dinner time. And so I just picked it up and said, hi, right? So it was mm -hmm. him. It was not him. <laughs> <laughs> it was alan at him it was no it was rob actually and he said oh. hey i wanted to know if you wanted if you were still interested in the quest design role and wow and if you wanted to come up and talk about that and i said uh yes <laughs> right? like, so I'm, like, I'm simultaneously like feeling like an idiot right um for yeah. answering the phone like that and yeah yeah that yeah. Yeah, was good but it was super <laughs> unexpected because like you know and, and a ton of time had passed too right so mm. like a month at least a month had passed and so I was like, absolutely sure that like, I was like, okay, this wasn't my moment, right? I'm going to hang in there. I'll, I'll get another chance. Blizzard takes forever to do anything. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so that was definitely a favorite moment. And then I think the, um, there was a moment where we put the website live to sign up for the beta. Um, it was oh. like this, the game had been teased, right? So everybody knew uh. that it was coming out, but the website, they put up the page where it was basically like, you know, you put your email in to sign up for the beta and the website came down within like 10 to 15 seconds, right? It just crashed <laughs> because like, it, and it was something like 500,000 people or something tried to like, like sign up at the same time. It's just some crazy number. I don't remember what it was, but it's yeah. some crazy number of people tried to sign up at once and it just crashed it. And everybody was talking about that that day. Um, so that was really fun. There was the weekend before the like it was like, I don't know if it was the weekend before maybe it was like two weeks before we were scheduled to launch the game. And there was that terrible uh, hurricane that I forget were they in Virginia? Where were the servers? Servers, I think were in Virginia. And there was a terrible yeah. hurricane, and the whole place where the servers were got flooded. Do you remember this? Um, vaguely. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing got flooded. And they had to turn everything off, right? Because it was in like three feet yeah, of water, right? right? And <laughs> or get electricity, so you know? <laughs> yeah, these are the servers that were supposed to be running the game in, you know, like less than two weeks. They were going to turn, you know, supposed to like everyone's bought the game, launch is already scheduled. Everyone knows they're, you know, like they're going to be expecting to play. Luckily, and I remember like a couple of people flew out. It was probably like Shane DeBerry, and I don't remember who just flew out to assess the situation. Yeah. Um, and uh, they got all back, they got everything dry and got it back up and everything launched on time. But it was just like this moment of absolute panic for leadership on that team. Um, I think the only other thing that I can think of as a moment that is specifically very memorable is just the, you know, the night that we launched the game, right? Because we did the oh. signing at, at um, 
Fry's Electronics oh, as yeah. we did in those days. I did that and for War 3 and TFT, but not. I wasn't there for WoW's launch. <clears throat> yeah, so I heard that for um, War 3, about 800 people showed up. Yep. For, uh, for WoW, it was the first moment where we realized this was going to be something big. Right. And it's uh, it's funny to say that because I think people, you know, think that like, oh, yeah, Blizzard knew the whole time that this was going to be this amazing thing. And no, we didn't. They had no right? idea. It was, ju no it clue. was just like, <laughs> hey, we all think this, this is going to be fun and we can beat EverQuest. Right. <clears throat> that's that's all it really was about. Right. We can yeah. we can make something that's well, we'll so, have like 11,000 players beat out EverQuest 10,000. <laughs> Well, I still remember it being like written on like like a whiteboard somewhere that like EverQuest's um, highest concurrent users at that point was five hundred thousand. So it was like we're gonna get a million. Oh, oh I, didn't I even remember. Know that I far. remember this being talked about. We're gonna get a million, right? Um, yeah. Okay. And that was the goal. And then we showed up for that signing, and the line was wrapped several times around the building. Like four thousand <laughs> people showed up. For oh that my signing. god! To the fry and signing. For the fries signing yeah the one that was in fountain valley which i don't know if it's still there anymore no they're all gone um, now. <laughs> yeah for fries. um and uh so yeah we all we signed until like three or four in the morning because the line was so long and they ran out of copies at fries yeah because not everyone pre-ordered they just thought they could show up and get one um and so we were signing whatever they had because some of them like didn't have a game yeah. and then they actually someone got into their car drove over to the office and got all of the employee copies that were supposed to go to us and they brought those back over to fries and we went through all of those they sold through all of those too um Damn. and it was just this completely unexpected and amazing moment right to yeah. be part of so I wonder how much a signed box goes for now. <laughs> I still have mine. Oh, you still have yours? Oh, yeah. you got to put that on eBay. <laughs> Do you happen to know who did Gorbold Steelhand's quest for the boxes inside the sunken ships in Darkshore? That might be a little, a little too esoteric. <laughs> Darkshore. I don't remember who did Darkshore. I want to say it was Pat. Pat did a lot of the stuff in Darkshore, I believe. But I don't, you know, I can't give you 100% on that one. Uh, okay. I, I think I also worked in Darkshore because I did the Buzzbox quest, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Buzzbox. Um, yeah. Uh, when, you, when you were to implement a new creature of a certain type and level range, wolf, bear, humanoid, murloc, did you have any pre-made loot templates at your disposal? I don't, you didn't even handle the drops, did you? I didn't, but I think the unique thing about the quest designers is that they were the only type of designer on the team where the entire editor was unlocked because we had to touch everything. Um, a lot they, of the, oh. so do, you, do you remember Bo talking about how like, hey, I couldn't get into this because it was locked out for me? Yeah. Everything was unlocked for the quest designers. Um, it, most so. of it was locked for me when I was doing the quests. Um, oh, interesting. Like I couldn't yeah. create items and, and things like that. I could, uh, oh. I, oh, I could create quest items, but I couldn't create weapons or armors interesting it is possible that carlos unlocked everything for me because i used to fix a lot of bugs for him so he may have gone in and just uh, turned it all on for me i don't know um but anyway uh as far as if there were templates everything was balanced uh through like level everything kind of was in like a like a spreadsheet right so it wasn't like yeah. if i was going to create tell me tell me the exact wording on the question again i want to make sure i'm answering it right uh when you were going to implement a new creature of a certain type and level range, did you have any pre-made templates? So I don't know that there were pre-made templates, but it was definitely like if you were going in to create a creature, you would give it a level and that level would reference what its damage was and what its hit points were. And so right. none of that stuff was being set individually. You could choose, I believe, to override things. You could mm. actually turn that on and say override this. Um, but generally we were encouraged not to do stuff like that because it was just it was so easy um and the quests were like that too so if you see like the level on a quest oh this this quest is level 38 that would actually feed into like let's say we say there's a gold reward for this we mm. weren't setting that we were just saying this quest is for level 38 yeah, and that yeah. was all being drawn from a spreadsheet that was balanced for everything um which was really important so i think there were a lot of that there was a lot of that around how um 
you know, creatures um, were being created as well. I think they tried to standardize most things like that, just in the, in the interest of keeping the game balanced. Um, and it worked yeah. really well, right? Like several times, um, I know that they would, you know, pull a lot of data out of the game and take a look at it and then rebalance things. And they could do that just across the entire game. Yeah. Um, by tweaking like algorithms and stuff that impact everyone in these <laughs> imagine having so. to yeah imagine having to go back and go through every quest and adjust all those things yeah uh Crazy. i can imagine it because guess what we did at net devil oh good god yeah see that's the thing <laughs> yeah so what i did when i came in there was i i was like this no we're not doing this so i actually made a um sort of a it was a spreadsheet where i was like i would put in all the values mm -hmm. And I kept those consistent across. I only had, there were three parts of the game because there was three races in the game. Yeah. I was only a lead on one of those. So if you went to my area, everything was balanced across the game because I created spreadsheets like that and typed in the right data from the spreadsheet every time nice. I made a quest. <laughs> the other leads weren't as interested in doing <sighs> that and they were manually just putting stuff in. So it was, it was all over the place as you might imagine. And rebalancing stuff was not easy i can't imagine so, yeah i can't imagine to you how did they not like see that you what you were doing and go wait <laughs> i want that so at net devil there were a bunch of people that were huge wow fans uh -huh. and then there were a few people that weren't anti-wow fans <laughs> yeah they they were absolutely anti-wow fans um, yeah okay i know the type and yeah. yeah like i don't know they they just wanted to do things their own way i think and this, so they took the the hard road fine <laughs> enjoy the miserable grind of changing I, yeah i can tell you hey not everything was perfect on wow though you know john you mm. um we had we had a running <laughs> joke that like because they would keep changing the um the stat attributes on weapons um, yeah. So you know how like you get a weapon and it's like, oh, plus two to stamina, right? Like yeah. that was the only thing, I'm sure it is now, but that was the only thing that wasn't in a spreadsheet that would get automatically attributed to an item. So he had a, like something that he followed. So he would create a weapon and then he would say, okay, it's level 12. And then it would give it the right damage for something that was level 12. But if he wanted to add a stat onto it, he had to do that manually. And there were a couple of times during development where we said, hey, we've rebalanced all the stats. You need to go back into all the weapons and redo them. And I watched him do this a couple of times. So I'm sure it's yeah. fixed now, but you know what? Like everyone should yeah. be super grateful to John Yu for putting in that time because that poor Jesus. guy had to do that multiple times during um, development on on uh, the original, on the original yeah, launching version of WoW. That's true pain. That, that sort of hard labor work. Um, so uh, this guy's from the Turtle Turtle WoW team. There was a Dark Cleric Salem's Chest in Tiras Fall Glades. It seems to be from a scrapped quest line. Do you know anything about that? That would have been done really early, right? So that was yeah. a really early zone. My guess is that that's probably a zone where Kaplan did some quests. But again, total guess on my part because it was no so idea. early. Yeah, I came in so much later that like I quested the later zones that came, that were, were coming in, right? So a lot of that stuff yeah. was Tears Fall, I would say for sure, is Kaplan because I know he did the original pumpkin quest, which is actually pumpkins. Right. And That's it why it's called the area. pumpkin quest. Yeah. yeah. So my <laughs> guess is it's something he put in there. It also could have been Pat. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, what was the very first quest you designed for WoW? The very first quest that I put in WoW. Um, yeah, I came in and like Pat was like, okay, I'm going to show you how to use the editor. He's like, first you need to come up with a quest. Here's the area where we need to fill in. And it was the night elf starting area. And he's like, we need a quest that goes to this particular area because we don't have a quest that goes here. So that's your quest. So go look around, figure out what you want to do and then come talk to me. And so I like went in there and I looked around and I made up something. Um, and it was about this dream catcher. It was called the Emerald Dream Catcher, I think is the name of the quest. But you um, you go into this area with a bunch of fur bulgs and you go and I think you, you there's like a couple of steps. You go in and you have to kill some of them. You go in and you have to go into one of the buildings and click on something inside the building. Um, I don't remember exact, the exact details, but um, it was all in that um, 
sort of starting area for the, for the night elves. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah. And I got to learn how to do quite a few things just from that quest because it, you know, so Pat could show me how to do it. Because I would say, well, I want yeah. it to do this. He'd be like, okay, well, you use this tool and this is how this works. And so it was kind of neat. Yeah. Um, Cave, I don't know if I'm saying this name correctly, K A E V, says they found an article uh, where you wrote that you played on Nostralius. Nostalrius? Nostralius, mm -hmm. isn't it? Did you enjoy playing on there more than Blizzard's Classic WoW? And if so, why or why not? Um, I think the community that was on Astarius was amazing because it was all these people that loved Classic WoW so much yeah. that they went and found a place to play it, right? That wasn't sanctioned. Like that's how how much of a, of a fan each of those people were. And because of that, um, what it reminded me of was, I don't know if you remember playing, playing WoW in the alpha and the beta, but there was just this feeling of community that existed mm. there because especially during the alpha when it was friends and family you knew that everyone you saw in the game was either someone you worked with or family of someone you worked with or right. friends with someone that you worked with and so there was this automatic just like goodwill yeah um and it was just a really neat time to be playing wow um and that's what it reminded me of was mm. everyone was just super nice they assumed that like you're here because you love WoW this much, and I'm here because I love WoW this much. And there was just, people would talk to you, they would friend you, they would invite you to dungeons. Like, it was uh, just a really neat thing to experience, especially after um, not playing for a long time. Yeah. Um, did I like it better? I don't know that I liked it better. There just wasn't any option to play it in any other way at the time. And so I kind of <laughs> yeah. went with that, right? And it was a total accident that I found it, right? It was... I had wanted to listen to the soundtrack again. Mm. So I went on YouTube and I started listening to, you know, someone had uploaded it. So I was listening to it and I started reading the comments and there's all these like really sweet comments about people that are just like, oh, this really takes me back to such a great time in my life. And, you know, so you're just like, oh, warm fuzzy. And then someone's like, come play here on the server. And I see yeah. that. And I'm like, what is this? And that's how I found it. Right. It wasn't like I even went looking for it. It was just, I happened upon it. <laughs> um, Became so, yeah, part of the zeitgeist. You know, just kind of neat and and being able to remember everything that we loved about it when we were working on it right and it was all back just the way it was it was kind of a special thing yeah well you can you can have that again with turtle wow <laughs> i keep shouting out their server because i did the interview with them but um and they seem to be able to protect it from blizzard <laughs> Uh, what was your favorite studio to work at and um do you still keep in contact with people at blizzard today um, I keep in contact with, with quite a few people. It's, it's amazing. Like when you go through something like that with people, how you forge friendships, um, I think yeah. much faster. Like I said, we were crunching and we were there and we were having to like solve problems together. And, um, and it was just really fun. I think, you, you know, you just, we had a good time. It was a good time working on wow. And, um, at least for me, that's how I remember it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think part of it was just excitement of like, Hey, I finally, I finally feel like I made it right. At least to some mm. degree. And I get to work on this thing. I'm so excited about that. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, if we're still talking, right. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course. We're still talking, right. We're still friends. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a few people definitely that, um, I made friends with on a while that are still, I'm still good friends with them today. Mm. Um, my favorite place that I've worked is an interesting question. It's a tough one, yeah. Because I mean, most... I didn't. I didn't. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just gonna say most people work at like you know two or three, maybe four studios in their career, but we've worked at like many. <laughs> so it's I couldn't really pick out my absolute favorite. I, I have things that I liked about different studios, but I I wouldn't say that any of them are like flat out the best. So it's interesting. I think um, I, I really enjoyed working at Blizzard. Um, it was a it was mm. a time where Blizzard was really small, right? There were like two hundred employees when I got hired. Which, like, yeah. I mean, I guess it's not it's not like indie small, but it's pretty small considering the success that they had at the time, right? With yeah. StarCraft and Warcraft Three, and um, you can still sort so of think, know everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was very everyone was just really friendly. That's what I remember about mm. Blizzard was it was very. Um, you, if you were there, you were just sort of accepted as part of the group, right? Um, mm. And that was great about it. So, um, 
and I was, I was working on something that I just was really excited about. And I find that that's sometimes rare. Like I've worked on a lot of things and some things I'm more excited about or less excited about. They're not always like a perfect yeah. match for me. I usually like everything that I work on um, in some way. I think that's just part of the creative process that as you make something, you sort of get attached to it. Yeah, um, it's true. But there have been few moments where I'm like, wow, the, you know, this this thing that I'm working on is something that I just absolutely love. And that's what wow was to me. Um, mm. So so I think there's that. I think if I come at that question from a different perspective, though, and I say, like, where did I where did I learn the most or, you know, um, have access to mentors or people that I didn't before? That would be um, when I was on The Sims. Mm. So I spent almost five years um, at EA and yeah, like I still have really good friendships from um, the time that I worked on The Sims and just just some of the best people that I have ever worked with in the industry worked uh, on that game with me. And The Sims, um, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I, I would say that. And also just that's where I really learned a lot about um, how, to, how to lead and mm. um, how to survive in a corporate environment, which doesn't sound like a, always a positive, <laughs> but survival skills are, are great to have, right? Yeah, they're um, great. I never learned them. To, so, <laughs> Yeah, to be able to navigate different scenarios <clears throat> with, you know, <throat> hey, there's executives in the room and how do we have to present this and what are we going to say? And, um, <clears throat> you know, I just, I learned a lot during those years that I look at as that's really what, you know, is sort of the beginning of me stepping into leadership roles and being given mm. that chance, uh, started there. That's awesome. Um, another esoteric one from Sinric, uh, who made Flaggle Merc the Cruel? He's a rare Murloc in Dorkshire Beach, but he hits like a truck. <laughs> what? Uh, <clears throat> if it's... If it's some if it's mob related and it's just like oh this is, there's a unique spawn here, yeah. I'll probably credit that to it would have to be one of the spawners. So it might be Jeff Goodman. Um, that's who he was the one that did a lot of stuff like that, but I don't know for sure. I don't remember. Jeff. Um, it was it wouldn't have been for a quest, right? If it's just like a unique spawn that sometimes pops up there, it's not it's not considered part of the the quest team's uh, content. Got it. Could have been Steven. Stephen Pierce, Mer Stephen Pierce, no, uh, or Andy Curtin could have been Andy. It was one of the spawners. I think I'd never really met all the people on the WoW team. Uh, I only knew the people who I worked with prior to them going to WoW. Um, other than the quest design group that was very early on. Um, yeah, and early on, that quest team would have been like Pat and Kaplan, right? Who else was doing quests at that time? Uh, there was, I think there was one more, but I don't remember. Michael Chu. Michael Chu. Yeah. Okay. Why did quest? Why did WoW's quest narrative move away from player control or being evil, like it was in Warcraft Three with Arthas and the undead lore? I think he's asking about why did the undead sort of become quasi good guys uh it's a great question i can tell you that during development there was something that was thrown around quite a bit and that was that the undead as as a as a race was going to be part of the horde but at some part it was at some point it was planned for them to like break away and turn really evil again oh, do you remember that right. being talked about? i that do yeah it was planned really early but it was something that i think they decided to take off of the table just for balance reasons i'm sure right it's hard enough balancing a game with two factions and they're uneven in some ways right yeah which they've completely gone back on on all of right because they're just like oh so much easier to balance it's everybody has everything right yep yep um so Cowards. yeah i'm pretty yeah i'm pretty sure that's <laughs> that's why um it's just it's a probably a balance thing but yeah mm. just know that that originally that was a thing that was was being talked about Oh, yeah, Sylvanas was going to break away. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been awesome. 
I, I still fun, remember that's that. That's a fun story moment. I, I think I have artificially recalled that as being my idea. <laughs> I don't think it was my idea, but I... Metzen used to talk about it. I can remember him talking about it, so... I do, too, like, very early on during the Frozen Throne. So, like, he was talking about it back then because that was the whole reason that Sylvanas had come back for the Frozen Throne as, like, a big character and, and like, you know, anyways. It's um, so interesting, like, so much was learned in those early years because, like... The, the kind of like the wish list of features, which is really like kind of like the live ops plans, yeah. you know, sort of what you would call that now, but like there's a wish list. That's what we called it. And it was like everything that we're going to do after the game launches. And it's crazy to think about what that looked like at the point yeah. before launch and how much of that stuff just, just went, well, that's not going to work for that way. Right. I, um, and I, everything changes. I found a folder, uh, in my archive of, of game design docs, uh, for wow that had a, several um like ideas for things that we could do on like the scenarios that could happen on goblin zeppelins and this whole cyclical nature to like the horde comes in and wipes out this fort and then it becomes horde occupied and then all the quests change to be horde for a while until the alliance rallies against it and wipes them out and it goes back and forth N none of they which they tried to do yeah they tried to do stuff like that later on right they had all those zones that like i think they really tried right they're like hey let's yeah. try this out i don't know if they were particularly successful in all circumstances not, not but, really you know they have tried a lot of things for sure <laughs> yeah it it's funny all those old ideas like it's good on paper but who knows um so exactly what are you up yeah, to now i mean like I can remember talking about, oh, um, sorry, I could talk about this all day. Um, uh, yeah. and I will. Uh, no, I remember <laughs> talking to Rob about, yeah, and we are. Uh, I remember talking to uh, Rob about, you know, and he was telling me things like, oh, well, eventually maybe there'll be things for you to do when you, you know, you get on the ship to like go to the other continent. And yeah. It's really just a means of like taking you from one server to the next server, right? We need to move you over here because this is all yeah. run by different like network of servers. And, um, eventually you know like he he said oh eventually you'll be able to there'll be like stuff to do on the ship maybe there's like you know you can have little game little mini games or something and i remember talking to him about this and it's like yeah. that never happened and it's a good thing that it didn't because like that's not a moment where people want to dwell that long they're sort of like hey i'm going somewhere i'm i've got things to do i don't want to stop here and i'm well, playing I, mini game right but it's just like it's interesting how things like that change right when you're like well i think this is gonna work but yeah yeah but it, it could work. It could be something that, like, if you had, like, a casino on the ships, there would be people who would just sit on the ships and go back and forth and around and around all day, <laughs> which I'm not sure if that's a good or bad thing, but it'd be interesting. Certainly break up the community a little bit. Um, For sure. So, <laughs> <A> casino. <laughs> I don't know if that's what he had in mind. That's no, one direction. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, a card game. Play Hearthstone. Put it in there. <laughs> Uh, so what are you up to now? Um, I know you're still with Sony, but I get the impression you can't say anything just yet. Or can you reveal anything about your what you're doing? I can I can say a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'm at uh, PlayStation London Studio. I'm working okay. on an unannounced title. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, online multiplayer co-op combat. Okay. And it is set in a modern fantasy London. Modern fantasy London. Wow. All right. High fantasy modern London. Like present day? Exciting, right? Yeah, that's interesting. No, that is really interesting. That's a little Harry Potter plus uh, high fantasy with dragons and stuff. That could be cool. Uh, I'm going to plug my Patreon now. So <laughs> if, uh, if anyone's interested in looking at old game design documents that uh, from any of the various projects that I've worked on, uh, including uh, Warcraft 3 and uh, and World of Warcraft. Those are on my Patreon. If you support me there, I can create more content like this and uh, everybody wins because I'm posting every week now. And, uh, you know, that's hard to do. So <laughs> check out my Patreon. Christine, anything you want to plug? Uh, no, just getting getting to talk a little bit about the game was amazing. So thanks for letting me do that. Oh, absolutely. Anytime. We can always do this again if uh, if uh, this didn't burn you out on talking about it. No, um, no, not at all. I am. Um, I very rarely I was telling you this. I very rarely get uh, a moment to talk about, you know, old school. Wow. 
Like no one's asking me about quests in a while anymore. So the fact that, you know, I get a chance to talk about something that was super fun for me. Yeah. I am always up for it. Uh, there's actually, I've been thinking about it. We should all, you, me, Bo, and uh, anyone else who's interested, we should all set up a day to go on the Turtle Wow Classic server and just play Classic Wow together. <laughs> yeah, I would totally do that. That sounds awesome. Yeah, That's, uh, that would be funny. And the Turtle Wow team uh, would obviously appreciate it too. Um, they are the ones who obsessively ask me questions about WoW that I can't answer. So I very much appreciate you coming on here and uh, answering yeah, some of their the, questions the for detail. me. The detail. The <laughs> detail. Yeah, I apologize for not knowing the obscure, uh, all of the, the things that are left over in the world. I'm sure there's tons of little legacy things like that. I, I don't even know that the person who did it would remember at this point. Which is That's kind of the problem. That's probably true. That's probably true. <laughs> I know that I put some a few things in there that I don't recall, uh, and I one of the reasons I want to play WoW Classic uh, on the Turtle WoW server is to see if I can find those things. Um, but I know they're out there. All right, I've I've taken up enough of your day, I think, <laughs> and I have a screaming child who needs attention. <laughs> um, that sounds uh, urgent. Well, I um, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed and uh, like and subscribe, all that good stuff. Check out the link tree, go to the Patreon and uh, check out Turtle Wow while you're at it um, <laughs> to relive the memories 